of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, this meeting is on Wednesday instead of Monday, which is our usual date because all councillors were at the National League of Cities meeting. However, all are returned and we're ready to begin here. May I have a roll call, please? Chairman Carson? Here. Councilor Berry? Present. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Roberts? Here. Councilor Swift Kayada? Here. Councilor Watson? Here. Representative Bolas? Here. And Representative Rowe? Here. Thank you. Give the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, next item is reports and correspondence. Uh, I will say at this time that I received a, uh, a nice heads-up phone call from our student representatives, Andy and Rebecca, that they have a very big paper due tomorrow and that they're going to excuse themselves early so that they can go and do them their homework. So when they get up and leave, that is why. Other reports and correspondence? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was... Uh at the National League of Cities uh, conference this past weekend, and it was really very interesting, exciting. We had an opportunity to meet with uh, Representative Allen and uh, Baldacci and express to them our concerns about the e-commerce uh, e sales tax uh, problem and losses that are affecting potentially the towns uh, getting revenue sharing from the state. I also had a chance to address with them the special ed costs and the taking legislation uh, found it very informative. Uh, pleased I could represent the town and made it back safely. Also managed to take in two or three other meetings this past month, and uh, I'd like to wish Michael happy birthday on Friday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Best is yet to come, Michael. <laughs> Council Swift Kayata. Um, yes, I attended the Council of Governments Executive Committee meeting earlier today. Um, there was a very interesting presentation by Larry Gross, who is Executive Director of the Southern Maine Area uh, Agency on Aging. And uh, what he did was talk about the challenges that towns are facing with respect to the expanding base of our aging population. We're all, all getting older. Um, and uh, we had a good exchange of ideas amongst the various town representatives there on different things that could be done to serve the needs of senior citizens better. Um, also, I wanted to mention that there are going to be training workshops run by COG at the end of March um, for both planning boards and zoning boards of appeals, people who are on those boards. And I know someone from Cape Elizabeth from the zoning board has already signed up, but. Um, I think those are going to be well worth it, excellent training for people who have uh, not got professional background on the boards. Thank you. Councillor Barry. Um, yeah, I have two things, uh, Madam Chairman. One, uh, on February 17th, our home caught fire. We had an electrical fire in the cellar, and I just wanted to express again the thanks of uh, my wife and myself for the prompt action of the uh, Cape Elizabeth Fire Department, who did such a wonderful job in uh, responding and saving our home after 38 years of living there. We, another 20 minutes, it might have gone up and spoke and smoke. So uh, again, great job, fellas. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as uh, my chairmanship of the Historic uh, Preservation Study Committee, the next two meetings will be on April 5th and April 19th at uh, 7 o'clock, respectively. And uh, we have... Uh, been struggling to arrive at a consensus for a final report of that committee after our meetings, forums, and so forth. And we hope to uh, bring that matter to closure about uh, that second meeting so that we can uh, issue a final report of the committee back to the council uh, prior to our deadline of uh, June 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you. I just want to give a final reminder to residents that nomination papers for council and school board are due in my office by 5 o'clock on Monday. We have three seats available on the council, three on the school board. The election will be held on Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, the phone calls have already started, so I will give you an update as far as the school board. There has been one set of papers turned in today. I will be verifying those tomorrow. Um, I have not heard from anyone else regarding the school board on papers. And three folks have taken out papers for town council, two of which have been turned in 
um, on that, and I anticipate that three will be running for that, at least three. So I encourage anyone that's interested to please contact me sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McGinty. I'd like to comment on a letter that was sent to the chair by uh, school board member Jim Rowe regarding state funding, um, GPA funding for the schools. And I concur with the letter that he sent to the legislature um, indicating with uh, such a large state surplus, budget surplus, that um, it's difficult to believe that we can't still be funded at the level, of, at least at the level we were funded last year. And I would like to see the, the chair um, compose a letter, mm -hmm. perhaps with the concurrence of the council, send it also to the legislature expressing uh, our dismay that at least we can't maintain the funding we had last year with, with, the, uh, with the budget. Okay. I'm writing myself a note so I don't forget. Thank you. Uh, also under correspondence, we have on our table tonight two letters of items that were to come up in the future uh, under workshop, I mean under public hearings tonight. We have one letter from Judy Potter uh, regarding the um, tower overlay uh, item which will be coming up. And we have one letter from Frank S. Stroud, young Frank, Jr., just Frank S. Stroud, I guess. Uh, regarding the 911 road change, which will be coming up on a later item uh, this evening. Uh, Town Manager's report. Yes, I had two items I w wanted to briefly go over this evening. Uh, the first is last month I mentioned that uh, our Chief of Police, David W. Pickering, had received an award from the Maine Association of Police, uh, with a group of uh, primarily unions uh, representing police departments, and that they had named him the uh, Chief of the Year by the uh, Maine Association of Police. Uh, in the last two weeks, uh, David was also named by the Maine Chiefs of Police Association, his peer group, which uh, covers every police department in the state, as Maine's uh, Police Chief of the Year. So it's a tremendous honor for him to be named not only uh, by the folks that work for him and for other chiefs around the uh, state, but also by, by his peers, the chiefs uh, in the state of Maine. And I know the council joins me in, again, congratulating David for... Uh, uh, this uh, duo of awards. Thank you. The second item I have before the council podium this evening uh, an update uh, on the financial piece of the uh, construction of the pool project in the fitness center. I do want to go over it a little bit, uh, not so much for the council because you'll have the text in front of you, but also for the members of the public who are here and may be listening uh, this evening as well, watching. Uh, the original pool cost in the fitness center uh, way back when it was planned three or so years ago, it was $2.2 million. Uh, subsequently, the bids came in for the project. We had also identified that insufficient funds had been, had been budgeted for some of the outfitting of the pool, the fitness center equipment for the contingency. And at the time the bids were awarded, uh, the council revised the, in, the total budget to $2,707,000. Uh, the pool project is now virtually complete. I am proposing that we continue to keep $20,000 in an account just as a reserve for final invoices and for other items that to totally outfit the pool. But the good news is that uh, there is $38,106 that can be returned uh, to the general fund uh, from the pool project. So uh, while it did not come in under the initial budget, it did come in $38,000 under the uh, revised budget. Yeah, the total amount of change orders for the pool amounted to $98,549, the largest of which was to add additional showers in the women's locker room at a cost of a little over $23,000. Uh, a couple I other that were optional items is we, we also decided uh, to change one of the floors in one of the offices, and we uh, decided to paint the bleaches, at, which weren't originally due to be painted, at a cost of $4,700. Some of you may recall around the time the pool was due to open, we had an issue with the heat exchanger. Uh, ex, ex, excuse me, excluding the water cost, uh, all of that, putting in the new heat exchanger and the, the out changing of the old, putting in the new, ended up at 7,411. Again, a total change order is 98,549. So I'm, I'm pleased uh, that the project is now nearly complete, that it did, did come in 38,000 under the revised budget. Uh, operationally, both the fitness center and the pool appear to be working quite well. Uh, the revenues are, are beyond expectations at this point. 
Uh, the fitness center staff seems to be universally loved by everyone uh, who goes in there. I uh, really appreciate the work. The, the pool uh, is also going similarly well. There's some issues. The students wish they had a little bit more time. The adults wish they had a little bit more time. We are constantly looking at those hours. There's already been one uh, change in hours proposed. We're going to be opening uh, slightly earlier in the morning. I believe it's at 5.30. It'll be coming up, up in a couple of weeks. And we're also looking at revising some of the hours where the pool isn't quite as busy. Overall, it seems to have been very warmly received by the citizens. And we're very pleased that uh, the pool is, is working. And uh, what problems there have been have been you know, the normal course of things you have when you when you open the facility. But I, I want to, again, thank the contractor, Wright Ryan, for all of their work, uh, Ernie McVean, our facilities manager, Sue Weatherby, uh, the community service director, as well as the pool director, David Turnage, and the fitness center manager, Lisa Petricelli, for all their efforts in getting the, the uh, project going. Thank you. And the building committee, particularly for the early work. Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair. Councilor McGinty. Um, in our packet, we had a uh, piece of correspondence from the county regarding our power options, electric power options. Mm -hmm. And um, where do we stand with that? I know March 1st we switched over. Um, yes, the, we were a member of the Cumberland York power aggregation. That's not the, the CYAC, whatever it stood for. Aggreg aggregation aggregation coalition. coalition. Thank you, John. <laughs> and right now we're, we're accepting electricity from the standard offer. We just received a letter today, in fact, from main power options. They, as, as of yet, do, still do not have their price. Once they let us know uh, what their price will be for the, the actual power cost, not for the transmission cost, which remains CMP, we will, we will look at it. And if, in fact, that is a better option, we will go to that instead of staying uh, with, the, with the standard offer, which I think is Energy Atlantic. Does that ring a bell with anyone? The one that everyone's getting in the household. But we are, we are looking at it, and as soon as uh, Main Power Options identifies uh, the, what their offer is, we'll do that. I'm going to treat this, too, like any other commodity that we purchase. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we, we don't get in any long-term uh, arrangements and that we can maintain maximum flexibility in order to get the best uh, possible price for electricity. Thank you. Uh. Well, the next item is uh, citizens' discussion of items that are not on the agenda. Are there any citizens who have items that they wish to bring up at this time? Hearing none, we'll move on to the minutes of the previous meeting, February 14th. Madam Chairman, I move that the uh, minutes of the meeting of uh, February 14th as written be approved. Second. Madam Chair, I had a... Um a correction. I believe I voted in opposition to the first item on the on page three. Page three, yeah. Uh, item seven three dash ninety nine. Yes. Okay. No, she did. Yeah. Oh. oh, so it'd be four, five. 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 Yes. Two. Five, two. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember that. See that? Yeah. All right. Any other errors or omissions? Hearing none, let's move the question with the changes, right? Yep. You want to make that motion again with the changes? That I move that the uh, minutes uh, with those am that amendment uh, be approved as read. Reflect the change. Of Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Now, we are in the, this evening we have set six items for public hearing. Um, that's probably a little bit more than we usually do, but we just, uh, through the holidays, you sometimes get bogged down in, in an offer, opportunity to, to get these out there for the public to comment on them. What we will do is take each, even though some items are related, we will take each item up separately. We'll have the public hearing. We'll close the public hearing. The council will debate and vote. We can't do them together or wait because each, each of you are here for certain items. So they'll be done one at a time, even though they're all public hearings. Item. The first item, item number 87, is a public hearing in consideration of a proposed amendment to the sewer user fees, which would bill all customers based on a minimum monthly fee of $26.50 and $4 per 100 cubic feet of measured water usage for use over 100 cubic feet. And I'm going to ask the manager to explain these first three items. She's going to explain this one first. 
Do you want me to explain the next two? Well, since they're related, why don't you explain the three sewer issues okay. so that everybody has that explanation? Thank you, Madam Chairman. As uh, Chairman Carson mentioned, uh, the first proposal would keep the current minimum charge of $26.50 uh, per month for each, uh, for the, as the minimum charge, and then change the incremental charge for water usage from $3.82 to $4. Uh, the reason for that proposed adjustment is to, to try to level out the sewer rates are being paid by apartment owners as compared to single-family dwellings. As the article in the March 4th Cape Courier indicated, uh, if, if you use the example of a three-unit apartment building using 900 cubic feet of water usage, they pay three minimum fees, uh, and plus with their incremental charge, it's $79.50 per month. A single-family home using that same 900 cubic feet of water usage would pay $57.06 or roughly $22 less than uh, the apartment house. Uh, under the proposed rate structure, each of these two, both the single and the apartments building, uh, would pay $58.50. So it would go from $57.06 to $58.50 in this hypothetical case, uh, and the apartments would go from $79.50 down to $58.50. Uh, the second item, uh, would also make a change to the school department bill. Currently, the school department pays $26.50 per month for every 10 students, faculty, and staff. It's proposed that beginning July 1 of 2000, that, that the bill be reduced from the current 63000 down to 53600 to the school department, and then thereafter, beginning July 1 of 2001, that all of the school sewer costs would be based on meter charges like everyone else. So uh, the school department for a long time has felt that, that they're way overpaying the sewer bill. In fact, uh, it's a difference of about 63,000 down to 25,000. The third item would increase the sewer connection fee for new connections from 2,700 to 3,000. Uh, this proposal, when it first came to the council, also proposed an increase in the minimum monthly fee. The council uh, quickly agreed that they had no interest in approving a an increase in the, uh, the minimum monthly fee. Instead asked us to look at it some more. We looked at the projections with Cross Hill coming on and uh, also looked at some of the work we've already done for infiltration and how well that's gone. And because of that, uh, uh, felt that we could go with this current proposal as the staff in recommending it, again, of the 2650 minimum charge and the $4 per 100 cubic feet thereafter, as well as the uh, uh, the connection fee, which actually was a council proposal, uh, and a change in the school department fee. Fine, thank you. Now we'll open the public hearing on item number 87. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Do, I, do you want me to read the item again? Do we, you all have a, you all have a agenda in front of you? Yeah. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on item number 87? Here, yes. Please give us your name when you speak. Arlen Davis for Woodland South. Um, I'd just like to urge your support of the measure tonight. Uh, it gives equity to a system that uh, has been going on since 1977. Uh, it's quite apparent and obvious uh, by the manager, the articles in the courier, uh, information that I've brought to the council that people for the exact same amount of usage pay much more for some residents of the town. And it's an issue of fairness and equity. It's a small, very small increase. It amounts to about a dollar and 20 cents on an average user. It's a very large savings for the school system, and it also still provides for infiltration. So I think it's a, it's a good piece of policy for the town. The managers said in the past that it's something that the town needs to address sooner or later. Uh, it equalizes all of the billing so that if other kinds of development come into the town and are on a sewer, there isn't a different kind of standard for them. It's the same for everyone. What you use is what you pay for. Apartment people are going to pay more as well. But I think that in equity and fairness, when they come to the forefront in this issue, uh, it's what really matters. And I hope that all of the counselors are able to support it tonight. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this item? Hearing none, I declare this public hearing closed. 
and open to council debate. <laughs> well, Councillor McGinty. Well, on this first item, I will not be supporting the increase. Um, I see this as a shift from taking, as Mr. Davis said, a little bit of money from each of the residents and giving a big bunch of money to a business, which is apartment building. They're a business. Um, they're not a single family residence. And so it's just another burden on the taxpayers, the sewer users in this case, um, you know, a dime here and a dime there. And considering that we're facing probably over a dollar in the rate, in the rise in the rate of the budget, the tax rate, um, based on the current budgets that have been presented, um, <laughs> it's, it's just more of a burden on the taxpayer. So I won't be supporting the increase. Okay. Jack, uh, yes. Yes, I had, Roberts. I had a, that's fine. <laughs> I had initially uh, opposed the amendment previously due to the uh, minimum going up. Uh, Cape Elizabeth is the only community that is using the current method that we na use now. All of our neighbors use the, the method that we are proposing. The average, the smaller households, by and large, you're, if you're elderly, I know we're concerned about it. Generally, they do not exceed the minimum. They will not exceed the minimum of this, so their bills will not, should not be going up unless they're using an awful lot more water than uh, I would be led to believe. Uh, I believe that now this will get us consistent with the other communities and with, with the minimum cost to the people that can least afford it. So I can't support it at this point. Councillor Barry. I, I think it's a, a matter of fairness if uh, one person in one dwelling unit is paying a lot more than another person in the a similar dwelling unit for the same amount of water, uh, I don't think that is fair. I think that, that we should support the proposal, and including the uh, school, but we're not there yet. No, right. We're doing one at a time. Councilor swift Cata. I will be supporting um, item 87, basically because I agree with Councilor Barry that it's a, a matter of fairness. I um, respectfully disagree with Councilor McGinty. I think that it is not necessarily the business that is paying the bills, but the, in an apartment house, rents are usually set to cover the business's expenses, so I think those expenses get pushed right along down to the people who live in the apartments. So um, I think it's a matter of fairness, so I will be supporting. Councilor Fritz. Um, I, I'm going to oppose <laughs> this um, increase. I, it, it, We've structured it so it's not a, a terribly big increase at this point because I, I think we didn't want to raise the rates. Um, and I think that our sewer rates are, are already much higher than in the rest of the county. Um, but I think this does shift the sewer charges to, um, it, it compares housing units to buildings, big buildings, in terms of big apartment buildings or big nursing homes. And I think we are generally a residential community, and it makes sense that our common denominator is the residential unit. And that's the way we've structured the rates now, and I think that I favor the current method, not changing it. Um, I think it's also short-sighted to, if, if you cut the revenue coming in from one source to not increase the sewer rate and leave some repairs and maintenance to the infiltration system is not a wise move. We're, we're talking about increasing the connection fee, but that's only one time connection income that's coming in. It's not over the long term to maintain our infiltration system and repair that so that we don't have a treatment plant that is is being overburdened. Um, I, I also think that when you're comparing, say, a two-bedroom apartment house with one person, I mean, a two-bedroom apartment unit with one person in it, it is not that different from one person in a small house in Cape Elizabeth. So I think that it's better to compare one, ho one house with one apartment unit. Thank you. I think we've heard from those that are planning to speak. Uh, Madam Chair, um, 
I have struggled with this issue and at times have found myself agreeing with Carol and, and John and at other times agreeing with the apartment owners who come in and talk about their situation and, and the fairness or unfairness of their, our current billing structure. I think the one thing that impacted me the most was at our uh, workshop. A, a woman came in and sat for a very long time while we had a discussion and was very concerned about the impact of her rates going up. And in the final analysis, when um, her, we reviewed her usage, uh, the, this new rate structure was not going to impact what she pays every month. And I think that was a very powerful thing for me to hear because at that point, the people who could, can least afford the increase, the likelihood of their bearing any cost of it is very low. And I have concerns about our seniors and our people who are in the single family dwellings and not in the apartments still being able to pay their sewer bills because we do have extremely high sewer bills in Cape Elizabeth. And if anything comes out of this, I'd really like to see us at some point, I think it's 2009 where we're going to be, we'll be finished with the paying for some of this and maybe in nine years we'll be able to see a reduction in our sewer rates. So that's something to look forward to. But um, as Carol was talking about the infiltration system, I think that's one of the strongest um, reasons um, to look at this and that we're not funding uh, improvements to the infiltration system. But um, in our workshop, we specifically looked at that one-time charge of increasing it by 300 to help with that. And it's not going to make up the difference totally, but it will get up, give us a head start if we didn't increase that fee. So I'm not so concerned about the infiltration system. I think that with Cross Hill and, and coming on and the development off Woodland or, or off Woodcrest, we're going to see some new housing coming in, and, and we'll see some increase in that area in terms of um, hookup fees. So a long story short, I, I am going to support this, but I have had severe reservations, and um, uh, it, it has been something where I've been on the fence about this. Thank you. I'll step forward and say that um, I've always felt that this was a matter of fairness from the time we did this. And when I first voted in 1979, I thought it was not the way to do it when I was on the council. So I will be supporting this change because I think it's been a long time coming. Now, I need to call a question. I need a motion. I move that we uh, support uh, uh, item 87 as, uh, as read. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you very much. We'll move on to item number 88 and open the public hearing. Item number 88, public hearing and consideration of proposed, am proposed amendment to the sewer fee for the Cape Elizabeth School Department that would over two years base the school sewer charge on measured water usage. I think as the manager explained before, this is the, we're in the same item that we were on in the beginning and that is uh, measuring a, the cost of our sewers by the actual amount of usage rather than just setting a fee. So is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak to this item? Hearing none, I declare this public hearing closed. And um, I think we'll put a motion on the floor first in order to discuss it this time. <laughs> Madam, Swift Madam Chair, I'd like to propose that um, item 88, uh, consideration of a, that we accept the proposed amendment to the sewer fee for the Cape Elizabeth School Department that would over the next two years base the school sewer charge on measured water usage. I'll second the motion. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Now discussion. I'd like, mm -hmm. I'd like to have the manager explain the, the uh, effect from the pool uh, just very quickly here. Yes, uh, this coming year, the budget, the school sewer bill will be $53,600. Right. Under this proposal, $5,360 of that would come out of the, the budget for the pool and fitness center, and the balance would come out of the respective school budgets. 10% for the pool, because the pool uses the most water, right? Thank you. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, number 89, we'll open the public hearing on item number 89, public hearing in consideration of a proposed, proposed amendment to the sewer connection fee, which would increase the connection fee from the current $2,700 to the to three thousand dollars. This is, of course, is a one-time fee for a home of any age connecting up to the uh, sewer system. Uh, anyone who'd like to speak from the public on this item?
here. Yes. You know, it would be better because we can't hear you too well. <laughs> so we'd love to hear your name, too. Hi. My name is Herbert Stroud. I live on uh, Spurwink Avenue. My only question was, what would the reason would be to increase it, increase the fee? Why would it be necessary to increase it? Yes. Uh, Mr. Stroud, the, the reason is, is that as more and more user units are added to the sewer system, they take more and more capacity of the system. Uh, in order to create more capacity in the system uh, to, to accommodate those new homes, you need to reduce infiltration from the rest of the system that's already in place. And the thinking is that, that these funds would be helping to reduce infiltration uh, in the rest of the sewer system, thus bringing the overall flows down and in the longer term bringing the cost down for all of the users. Thank you. Are there any more comments to the, from the public on this item? Hearing none, I declare this public hearing closed. And again, I'd like a motion first before we go to discussion on item number 89. Councillor Barry. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that uh, on item number 89, public hearing in consideration of a proposed amendment, that the proposed amendment to the sewer connection fee uh, be adopted, which would increase the connection fee from $2,700 to $3,000, which would be an increase of $300 for each unit. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion, please. Councilor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to mention that there has not been an increase for several years in the cost of the connection fee. So this is basically putting us back almost even with, with where we were when it was initially put in place. Further, a number of the, obviously the houses that are being built now, this $300 increase is a, a really a small percentage of the overall cost. We're talking houses going up from 350000 to $3 million. So I don't think that there's going to be a major impact on those particular builders. And it will help to address the problem with the infiltration and was part of the overall package. Thank you. Any more discussion? Hearing none, I call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. You'll be happy to know we're through with the sewer items now. <laughs> Item number 90. This is a public hearing on a change on a proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance, recommending changes in the variance standards that would replace the, quote, words in our ordinance that call for the words undue hardship, unquote, standard and changing those words to practical difficulty, unquote, standard for variances outside of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. I'm going to ask the town planner to give a brief synopsis of this proposal and hopefully make it clear for some people, for the public anyway. One minute brief? Brief. Well, one minute brief? Can you do it in one minute? I can do it shorter you don't have to keep it to one minute, but we'll yeah, make it brief. Right now, the, the, uh, the, the town of Cape Elizabeth and uh, I think almost every other town in the state grants variances based on what we call the undue hardship criteria. Those are criteria that are laid out in state legislation and communities do not have any leeway in, in what kind of language they adopt. You have to adopt exactly what the state says and the undue hardship criteria includes a standard that says that you basically have to have no reasonable return in your property at all in order to qualify for a variance. Uh, the Zoning Board and uh, the former chair of the Zoning Board, I believe will be speaking on this, has struggled mightily with the undue hardship standard and has determined that um, they're going to follow that standard uh, to the letter, which means that uh, there's probably uh, only a rare instance in the town of Cape, Cape Elizabeth when anyone will ever be able to qualify for a variance. Um, recently, the, the state legislature has uh, uh, recognize the struggle that many communities have had with this very strict standard that almost no one can really meet and have adopted a, a, an optional standard called the practical difficulty standard. That standard does not have the same criteria that says that there's absolutely no economic value left in your property. Instead it talks about, uh, it's still a fairly tough standard, but it, it talks more about whether or not your proposed activity, if your variance is granted, will be compatible with the neighborhood. And uh, the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board is saying that is what they usually do when they look at a variance. Um, so what you would be considering 
is whether or not you're going to give the zoning board a tool that they say they would like to have, which is some flexibility, or whether you want to stick with the current standard, which means that they probably won't be granting any more variances for a while. Um, that's the, the simplest way I can explain it. Any questions? Well, I think we have a couple. You want to ask a question, Maureen? Yes, Maureen, mm -hmm. does this replace the other language totally? Or does it, it yes, do? yes and no. We have, in doing our research, determined that uh, the state does say that you cannot apply the practical difficulty standard in the shoreland district. So what we've done is we have separated the variance criteria into two sections. Variances for shoreland zoning and variances for everything else. So under the variances for shoreland zoning, we're retaining the undue hardship language. But under variances for everything else, we're replacing the undue hardship language with the practical difficulty language. Do we have that authority under state law? Because it has not been repealed under state in, law, is my understanding. In fact, we are required to do it that way. Because it, when, we, when we originally looked at this, we didn't realize there was this provision about shoreland zoning. Our original uh, proposal was to completely replace the undue hardship criteria with this option called practical difficulty. And it was only when we started reading some of the fine print, we realized that uh, there is no option to replace it in the shoreland zone. Was Cape, was Cape Elizabeth represented at the uh, recent meeting of the municipal attorneys? That have a uh, I have this? no idea. I, following your most recent workshop on this issue, you did raise some questions about whether or not we can change the language. And so I did speak with our town attorney again and asked your questions again. And uh, his answer remains the same. You have to adopt the language exactly the way the state has adopted the language. If you do not, uh, he does not believe you're in compliance with state law. Uh, further, if, if there are some changes to the state law, certainly uh, Cape Elizabeth at that point can come back and revise its zoning ordinance again. Um, I do know from, from you that there are some attorneys who would like to make some changes, um, but it's, it's very clear that you have to stick to the state statute language. That was the answer I was given. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for that nice synopsis. Uh, anyone else from the public? Yes, would you please, for the public, state your name. My name is Hank Warren, and uh, I am a member of the public in the sense that I'm a former chair of the zoning board. The current chair, Ann Elderkin, is here and may choose to speak on this, and therefore I can't speak for the board except uh, the board as it discussed this issue during my tenure. And I've given this speech uh, to several of you more than once, so I'm not going to take very long at it. Uh, and I don't pretend to understand all the legal ins and outs, uh, but what I do understand is from the perspective of a uh, zoning board member who is trying to do the best they can for the town to come up with reasonable solutions to difficult problems that people face in dealing with alterations to their property, in most cases property located in districts that have tight zoning, uh, older <coughs> homes, older lots, and who love the town, want to stay in it, and can't function in their current setting because of an increase in family size or perhaps having more money or whatever it is. And the board got increasingly concerned and increasingly pressured by uh, people to take a close look at the existing statute and the existing ordinance and realize that the kind of variances we were often giving really were not consistent with the criteria that the law calls for. And we decided uh, at that time, some nine months ago, that we would begin uh, to pay much more attention to that and the number of variances dropped dramatically. But at the same time, we asked uh, ourselves and ultimately the planning board and now the council to take a look at an alternative which the legislature has created and which I'd be the first to admit is not perfect. Uh, and in fact, I've, in all the years that I've dealt with the legislature, very few things they put out are perfect. But uh, this seems to us to be a better alternative to give the planning board the, and particularly the zoning board of appeals and the community a little more flexibility to deal with real problems on the ground that citizens have that will not have a significant impact on the community, but do have a significant impact on the ability of a family to continue to live in this community in a way that's reasonable. So I'll, st I'll stop with that and leave the <coughs> definitions and explanations to the experts, but uh, I do support it and ask that the council take serious consideration of it. 
Thank you. David. Hello, I'm David Laurie. Uh, David, I live put, put the speaker down there. Thanks. All right. I live at 189 Spurwink Avenue, and I'm here. Uh, I practiced law for 25 years uh, in the municipal law area, doing a lot of zoning. And uh, I'm here to speak as a non-lawyer, except uh, because I'm speaking as a citizen. I'm not here representing anybody. And I'm here to tell you um, that I'd like to support this ordinance because God knows the state standards don't work. They are, they're the product of a mistake by the legislature. Well, one of many mistakes by the legislature. There's a saying, you know, the people of the state of Maryland and their property are not safe so long as the legislature is in session. And there's a lot of truth to it. Uh, back in the, I believe it was the late 60s, it was a law court decision, a state Supreme Court decision on variant standards. And that they, they proposed the four standards, which are basically what we have in the law now. Um, and those standards were later adopted by the legislature for all variances. They were originally supposed to apply only to use variances, not to dimensional variances. So they've never worked. And the, um, the no reasonable return standard doesn't work uh, when you want to build out a deck and there's no problem building out the deck, except that it technically violates the ordinance. So people play games, they create setback reductions and so forth. Uh, I mean, municipalities try to, uh, when I say play games, uh, municipalities try to deal with the problem in other ways. But over the years, municipalities have been unable to legislate their own variant standards. Maureen is absolutely right. You can't create your own variant standards. You have to adopt or not adopt what the state legislature did. Uh, the Portland, the people who put this together in, in, in I was about to say in Portland, they, they tinkered with it a little bit. They left out the, the problem with, the biggest problem with the, uh, the new statute. Uh, they just left it out because uh, they couldn't deal with it and they wanted to adopt something which is more liberal than what they have. So now they have something which is probably illegal because you can adopt, under the state statute, you can adopt ordinances which are more strict. Actually, what I said a moment ago isn't technically correct. You can adopt limitations on variances. You could even probably get rid of variances altogether. Uh, what you can't do is adopt something which is more liberal in the area of variant standards than the state statutes provide. And when people tried to tinker, tried to make the state statute work for Cape Elizabeth, and they came up with this draft, uh, they tried in a number of ways to insert definitions where there weren't any under state law. Those may or may not work because to the extent that they're more restrictive, they're allowed. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to adopt more st restrictive rules, but you can't adopt more liberal ones. And when you merely define something somewhat differently than it's defined in state law or where it isn't defined, where you add a definition and take away the discretion of the board to apply the state statute, uh, it's questionable whether you can do that or not. That's something. I'm here to speak against my own, my own self-interest because as a municipal lawyer, I get lots of work when municipalities adopt ordinances like this, which uh, it makes lots of work for lawyers and, you know, and I make more money. But uh, I am here to speak against it, although I'd like to support it because I know the intention here is to, uh, if not liberalize the uh, variant standards, at least to apply some kind of rationale to them, which... Uh, they're presently missing. As I said before, they were, they were intended for a purpose, for one purpose, and they were adopted by the legislature for another purpose, and they don't work. Um, New York and a lot of states have a standard of practical difficulty. Uh, most places it's been evolved by the courts rather than by the legislatures. Uh, but uh, in Maine, this is all cut off because the legislature adopted this other standard, and, and no one has ever been able to adopt a practical difficulty standard before. And the legislature, uh, do you mind my running on a little bit no, on this I, thing? I, this I just want you to, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I, I guess I don't understand why is it in Maine that nobody's been able to adopt the practical um, well, you can't, you can't, there's no home rule as to variant standards. That's the problem. Yes, I understand that. And uh, the, the uh, oh, because this, it's more liberal than the state, you mean? 
Is that what we're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that the, what the legislature gave you in terms of a practical difficulty standard is unworkable, and I was about to get to that. It's, it's unworkable. It doesn't give you much more in terms of a workable standard than the existing ones, which are pretty bad, but at least we know what they are, and at least there's been judicial gloss put on them. And some people can qualify for variances under the existing standards, not very many, if the board is, in fact, applying them properly. But some people can qualify for them. You're going to, in fact, get rid of that if you adopt this proposal to replace altogether uh, the existing variant standards with this new animal, uh, which is supposed to be a practical difficulty standard. The problem is, with the practical difficulty standard the legislature gave you, um, as usual, uh, it's filled with a number of compromises. There were a number, there was a lot, intensive lobbying by the planners on this one, the state planning office in particular. Uh, and they injected into, an or, into a statute which is supposed to deal with dimensional uh, variances, concepts of use again. They, the definition of practical difficulty, which you'll find on the first page of your, uh, of your, uh, proposal here comes directly out of the statute. It says, an occasion where the strict application of the ordinance to a property precludes the ability of the property owner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located. That's what you have to do. That's not a whole lot better than the no reasonable return standard because you still can't build a larger deck than you were allowed to do you still can't put that addition on the house because if you have a house already, you're, you've, you know, you've already got the use that's permitted in the zone. You have to be able to show, again, that you can't use the property consistent with the zoning ordinance. And that's not a whole lot better than showing no reasonable return. And that's in the statute, and you can't get around it, unfortunately. David, uh, we, we do have a five-minute limit. Right. We are happy to extend, and I also would like to... Be sure that the council has an opportunity to ask any questions of you or anybody else who speak on this. But we want to be sure if there's anyone else to speak, they have an opportunity as well. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, does the so council wish David to extend his yeah. conversation? Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. We're not even okay. vote, David. Go ahead. All right. Uh, that's that's the biggest problem in this. There's lots of undefined language and and problems created by the lack of definition, state law, and so forth. But I'm not going to get into this actual draft because I think that. Uh, I don't want to get bogged down in that tonight. Uh, in terms of concept, you've got a proposal which really doesn't work. You know, uh, there was a meeting, uh, Jack mentioned it, there was a meeting of municipal lawyers. It's called the Roma Group, Regional Organization of Municipal Attorneys. We get together periodically and we talk about problems. There were 20 odd municipal lawyers in the room and not one of them thought that this was a workable statute. Uh, not one of them would recommend it to any municipality that they represent. Uh, because there are great problems in it, and you don't. And whenever you adopt something, uh, you're going to foster a lot of litigation uh, over it. And you know, in this particular standard, you know, with the limitations on it, doesn't work. I talked to an MMA attorney who was at that meeting uh, just the other day and asked whether uh, anyone had adopted the practical difficulty standard in place of the existing variant standards. They got rid of those variant standards, which, as I said, worked for some people at least. And they said, no, where it's been adopted, it's been adopted as an alternative. And that's the way that these, uh, the way the statute works. The statute says that there are some variances which the board has to have jurisdiction over, uh, some variance provisions the board has to have jurisdiction over, and there are others, like the disability variance, for example, and there are others which are optional. You can adopt them or you can not adopt them locally. And, for example, the demonstrated need variance, which is subsection C, we're talking now about uh, uh, subsection C is the dimensional uh, variance, standard. sorry, subsection B is a setback variance for single-family dwellings. You, you're allowed under the statute. You don't have that unfortunately. That's one of the other options. People who have adopted that adopted it, like Falmouth, adopted it as an additional variant standard. So I can go up to Falmouth. In fact, I had a case in Falmouth which involved a dimensional variance, and we proceeded under, under 4B when they adopted it 
uh, despite the fact that uh, my client had previously been denied a variance under the straight variance standards. And, and you know, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to replace the existing variance standards. You can offer this as an alternative if you really want to adopt this. I don't think there's much value in adopting it at all, but if you really want to adopt it, I would strongly urge you not to throw out variances as we know them. Throw out what? Variances as we know them. We may not like them, but at least they're available right now to some people. Some people can qualify. I doubt that many people can qualify into this, and if they do and there's any opposition, it's going to be a few years in court before they get to actually do what they're going to do. Um, and so I, I really think that this uh, is a mistake to adopt it in place of uh, the existing variance procedures. Uh, I think that uh, existing variance standards, I think if you're going to adopt this at all, you should adopt it as an additional, uh, way, as an additional um, basis for the board to act. Uh, but as I said before, I don't think it works. Uh, if, uh, I'm not going to take up more time tonight telling you why I don't think different provisions here work. I'm not sure that they don't work, all of them. But I think that there are problems in this. I've looked at it, and there are a number of problems. I've marked up the first page here. You can see the pluses and the check. The single check is what came out of the statute. The pluses are what's been added here in terms of local uh, definitions, and I don't think that those will stand up in terms of necessarily being stricter than the state mandate than the state formulation. I think that they they may very well be defective as well. So I think there are problems here with the with the with with what is technically being proposed, but I think the concept is fundamentally flawed of substituting, uh, replacing this. Um, the, the, the normal variant standard of undue hardship with something new and different. Uh, you're throwing out the baby, and the bathwater may be no good. Thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to hear from uh, all the members of the public who wish to speak on this. Please. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ann Elderkin. I'm ch the new chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Some have said congratulations, others have extended their condolences. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on the board for just a year. At my first board meeting, we met with the town council about the difficulties of enforcing this very, very difficult zoning ordinance that we've had on our books. And uh, basically, we, were, we were, uh, read the Bible about how we needed to protect the town's liability by not being overly um, subjective or interpretive, but to stick strictly to the ordinance. And we found that we could hardly give an ordinance, a variance, um, or respond to a request. And it was a very difficult position for a zoning board to be in when there were many requests that seemed reasonable, but by these um, hardship criteria, we could, not, we could not grant. Under the leadership of Hank Warren, we began to look at alternatives and um, came up with this proposal. We met a number of times as a zoning board. We met with the town council. The planning board has looked at it. There have been a number of different discussions with, with many people, and in fact, a work session with this council. And none of the concerns that have just been presented have been aired before. This is the first time that we've heard these concerns. Um, I am perplexed that these concerns haven't come to light now, and I'm concerned. Uh, I would suggest that you may wish to consider tabling this issue and have our town council respond to the legal concerns that were raised uh, very, very legitimately by the previous speaker and take a look at this and come back to you with a recommendation on that so that we're all comfortable with, with the information and, and the legalities of what we're looking for. Our goal as a zoning board is to maintain um, Cape Elizabeth um, to the highest standards and to be as fair as possible to the people who live here. We want to do it in the most legal way, but we also want to have enough flexibility to, to allow some reasonable flexibility with this. Um, it has been our feeling that this would allow us more 
flexibility than we currently have. Uh, we would like to take another look at it, and I would respectfully request that you consider tabling it until we can have that further discussion. Thank you very much. We're going to see if there's anyone else who wishes to speak from the public on this issue. Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Stevenson, and uh, I have, uh, I'd like to present with you, I'm here to speak in favor of adopting the proposed changes, and I have a petition here, which I've circulated amongst neighbors and friends. It's actually two pages. I think you might have got one copy today. Uh, I don't know about the, leg the technical legalities that were raised by Mr. Lurie. Um, I read the ordinance as it was proposed, it seemed to make sense to me. But I can tell you this, uh, our system doesn't work right now. Uh, I had the misfortune of trying to get a variance for what I thought was a simple and reasonable use uh, on my property uh, to add a garage in a neighborhood that an RA zone where all my neighbors have garages. And not getting into the specifics of whether or not there were any other issues to worry about, uh, I was told when I uh, went to get the forms, uh, I was told off the record that don't expect much because now the town is strictly interpreting what this ordinance means. And as I understood it, and as I understood it after my request for a variance was denied, that the current standard is virtually unmeetable. So in my opinion, it's, we got a broken system when there's no flexibility at all for the zoning board. And that's what I currently see, is a system where there's no flexibility. Uh, I thought that, you know, having read the proposed literature, or rather the proposed uh, changes and the, and the uh, definitions, that, you know, I started putting check marks. Yeah, this makes sense. It all seemed to make sense to me, with one exception, and that is under uh, B, uh, paragraph B, powers and duties, uh, section D, where it says, no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Uh, I don't know to what extent there is mandated language throughout this, but in this sentence, I would urge a change to, instead of the word available, you say practical, uh, is practical for instead of available to. Because what's available and what's pre it, that could be anything. Uh, that could be a very difficult thing to do if you had a ledge or a boulder next to your house on one side, but you had the set, but you had the distance there. Then it would be you could say, well, you could come in and you could destroy this big chunk of rock, spend thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, and put what you want over here and meet the setback requirement instead of putting it on this nice flat level ground over here. And even though it will blend in with the rest of the neighborhood, that would be something that I could see happening. So I think that you've got wiggle room for the zoning board in, uh, in section B1. Well, excuse me a moment. Can't read anymore without these. <laughs> Where it says, uh, to grant variances from the terms of this ordinance provided that one, I, there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. To me, that creates a great deal of wiggle room so that for the zoning board to deny what they regard as a, uh, a, a request for a variance that might otherwise be adopted but just doesn't make sense in the neighborhood. So there's places there where the zoning board can exercise judgment in the way this is written, but I feel that the, word avail the words available to suddenly restrict what is possible in this proposal to a very narrow set of alternatives and are not in the spirit of the flexibility with which I think this proposed ordinance has been put forth. So uh, if it's possible, I would urge you to adopt it, and, but with the only change being, like I said, in B1D, to the available to, to practical for, it still would be a judgment call on the part of the zoning board, but at least it would not preclude things that are possible with an unlimited budget but uh, which may not make sense for the property in general uh, or really just be, meet this, the common sense test. 
And that's all I would like to see is to see the common sense test be uh, something that, you know, we, the board has the power to deal with. So in any event, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to speak to this issue? Hearing none, I declare this public uh, hearing closed on this item, item number 90. Thank you. Now, council. See where everybody's at, what you'd like to do. Councilor Roberts. Before I make a motion, could I ask Mr. Laurie another question? Put your speaker down, David. Thank you. That is tough. Dave, do the, David, do the municipal lawyers have a plan to try and correct this, and is there a timetable on it? Well, I think there's a consensus, and the MMA lawyers are going to take the lead on it to go to the legislature, uh, not the way that um, municipalities have for the last 25 years with a specific proposal like the practical difficulty standard or the demonstrate need standard and then find the legislature tinkers with it and puts in unworkable provisions but just to go and see if you can get home rule with regard to variant standards so that you can uh, they would the, the plan I think or at least the consensus was that uh, uh, that that MMA would put forward something in the next legislature which would um, uh, keep in place the variant standards as they presently exist as an option uh, for uh, municipalities to have or to adopt, but would give flexibility to adopt ordinances uh, in this area as you do in all other areas uh, involving, you know, under your home rule power, so you can craft what seems to work for you as opposed to having to accept the formulation that came out of the legislature. Thank you. Council Roberts. Yes. Um, no one, I don't believe, is any more sensitive to the zoning issues than I am. I wanted to put an addition on my house, and <laughs> the pond was 249 feet away, so I couldn't do it, even though they could bring in cows across the street. So I, I know the straight face uh, test, and it doesn't work in a lot, of this thing, a lot of these things. I would like to see us put something on the books that would allow reasonable additions to properties to bring them up consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. But there are some real legal concerns with it, in my opinion, and I would like to uh, take up Ann's uh, recommendation that we table it, discuss it with a lawyer, um, and see where we can go from there. Rather than act in haste, put something on the books and find ourselves being sued because we've granted something and the neighbors don't like it. Um, as everybody knows, people are very quick in this community to take a case to court, and it will happen, and it won't take long if we do something that is inappropriate. So I would uh, move to table. I'll second that motion. Well, takes care of that, doesn't it? <laughs> Tabling item is not debatable. I'll have the vote, please. All those in favor? What was that? Four? Six more. Is the clarification, is that indefinitely or to a time certain? To a time certain? I uh, no, I wasn't given any time certain. Would people like me to? Well, no, you're, it just what depends you, on if you're killing it or not. You're you tabling it indefinitely. You, no, I'm not trying to kill it. I'm okay. trying to. No. Okay, and what were the four votes to table? Just Any, uh, all those opposed? Just in, it, can, um, it's clear to the staff that the tabling motion is with the intent of revisiting the issue. Right. Correct. Yeah. All those opposed to the tabling motion? Okay, it's four. It's five. Five. Five to six. Motion carries. Item number 91. <laughs> I would like to say on, uh, on the last item, I did forget to mention that there was uh, a handwritten petition brought forward tonight that had uh, some 20 names on in favor of granting the new variance language. I wanted to be sure that people knew that was here. Item number 91. Public hearing and consideration of proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance relating to telecommunication towers and tower overlay districts. This is not a new item to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. This has been out there now for I don't know how long, a year maybe. And um, we have the proposal in front of us now. The public hearing is open on this item. Anyone wish to speak to this, please? Maureen, do you wish to make a brief synopsis about this? Um, 
Well, this is for the members of the public on the TV. This is Maureen O'Mara, who's the town planner. The reason you're dealing with this this, this evening is because the federal government adopted the Telecommunications Act in 1996, and I think most people will agree that one of the major policies coming out of that act is that they want to create a national uh, wireless telecommunication infrastructure that all the citizens of the country have access to. Uh, therefore, they have uh, basically said that you cannot prohibit the construction of towers in your community if that is what is needed to provide wireless services. Uh, most communities are responding uh, by using what powers have been left to local government to regulate towers, uh, to come up with regulations that uh, are supposed to be reasonable enough to regulate location and size while not prohibiting the provision of wireless services to any resident of the community. So what you have before you this evening is a set of amendments to the zoning ordinance that propose to regulate the construction of new towers. Uh, the regulations do two things. That, well, they do several things. One is um, they create what we call a tower overlay district. In other communities, what they have done is they have made towers a permitted or a special exception type of use in their commercial and industrial zones, and in that way have been able to allow the construction of new towers as needed. In Cape Elizabeth, because there are no industrial zones and there are almost no business zones and certainly not in a location and of a size that could accommodate any needed towers, uh, the alternatives were either to open up the residential A district to towers town-wide or to pick a couple of individual locations which, uh, based on the town's best estimate and the results of, of a survey by a consultant, could provide adequate wireless services to the community. So what you have done is you are actually proposing two locations in town where towers for commercial uses would be permitted with site plan review by the planning board. Uh, so you're proposing to amend your zoning ordinance to allow towers uh, you've created a brand new set of standards for towers, which I would consider state-of-the-art standards in regulating towers. Uh, third, you have taken uh, the zoning map and you've created two areas. Uh, one is uh, 351 Spurwink Avenue, which is owned by Herb Strout and currently hosts the tallest tower in town. Um, the other site is 472 Spurwink Ave, which is the site owned by the town and is the transfer station and has been the subject of a study by the town and is a feasible location to locate a tower. Uh, so these are the amendments you have before you this evening. The last set of amendments you have are your very first uh, changes to the comprehensive plan that was first adopted in 1990 because, as you are all aware, um, it is absolutely critical that your zoning ordinance and your comprehensive plan be consistent with one another. And there is nothing in the current comprehensive plan that mentions towers. Uh, so it was necessary to actually draft uh, some amendments to the comprehensive plan that talk about the town's policy regarding towers. So those are the amendments that are before you this evening. Any questions? If, if we do not uh, select these two particular proposed sites that the consultants have recommended, then is it true that we'd have to have a bunch of little towers for repeaters in various places around the town? There's nothing that says you won't still have to have little towers with repeaters. Uh, what you need to do is you need to make a provision for the construction of a tower if one is needed. If you do not do that, um, you are leaving the town uh, very vulnerable to a potential lawsuit from an industry provider who says that you, your rules, the town's rules regarding telecommunication towers, essentially ban them. And as I said earlier, you can't just ban towers without running afoul of the Federal Telecommunications Act. With the federal right. What the ordinance proposal does do is create a new entity in the zoning ordinance called a tower overlay district. And you're actually then putting the district into places in the community. The fact that you even have this thing called a tower overlay district, I believe, also gives you an interim step if you have a provider out there who isn't satisfied with the two locations you've made provisions for. If that provider doesn't, that provider doesn't necessarily automatically have to sue the town. They can actually come to the town council and make an argument that they have a better location and ask to be zoned for a tower overlay district. So I think it's also a really good technique for the, ta the council to verify the assumptions you've made up until now regarding wireless services in case something new comes up that we haven't found. Thank you. Are there any other citizens from the community who would like to speak on this issue? 
I'd like to ask Maureen. If yeah, I, Maureen. This, this is principally for cell phones. Uh, then and the the, uh, the transmitters for cell phones. The what do you call them? Antennas. Yeah, it's it's. They have to be how many feet apart? Um, what we're being told is that when you place antennas on the same structure, they oh. have to be about ten feet apart. Ten feet apart. Right. All right. Thank you. I think the other part of Council is Barry's question, Maureen. This isn't simply for, a, for cell uh, phones. This is for all public safety communication. It's for all personal communication devices. The whole realm of, of what might come up in, in new technology that requires an antenna to be placed on a structure that uh, has a clear sight distance. It, it's very comprehensive in, in that for the first time, it's not just regulating commercial wireless <coughs> operations, it's also regulating amateur wireless operations. Uh, the original committee that you created, the Telecommunications Task Force, made a recommendation that, gee, if we're regulating commercial towers, uh, we can think of a couple of ham radio towers in, in a couple of neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth that seem a little large for the, for the area, and maybe it's time that we regulate those as well. So there are regulations that, that pertain to amateur wireless communications in this, this document as well. Thank you, Maureen. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak on this issue? Yes, please. My name is Bob Danielson, um, 14 Reef Road, and I'm also president of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Um, I wasn't intending to speak on this issue tonight, but I noticed the location of the two towers, and I've just got a couple observations. One is, it seems like the criteria for locating a tower is a high spot. And Cape Elizabeth is set up such that the high spots are wide open and visible for miles. If you look at the Sperwink Road, you can probably see it from the high school complex and from 77. So the fact that we're sticking a tower on top of a high spot takes a real pretty view and makes it really ugly. Um, the second observation I have is that Maureen accurately pointed out Cape Elizabeth has no industrial or commercial zone to speak of. And what's happening across the country is that most municipalities are sticking these things in industrial zones because they are more compatible with what's already there. Uh, Cape Elizabeth has a very unique community in that it's totally residential. I just feel that it would be real sad to take our highest and best spots and stick ugly towers on them. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Yes. My name is Paul Strout, and uh, I'm Herb Strout's son. And the thing that I'd like to point out is uh, Dad's been in the communications business since the, since the 30s. He has an existing tower site, and his towers have been there for 50 years. So it's not, uh, I'm, I mean the tower business. I build towers. They're, they're beautiful to me. Obviously, <laughs> other people don't agree. It's all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at, I, I go down the, the road and I look at telephone poles. And I say, my God, are those ugly? You know, put one tower over here, not 7,000 telephone poles. But the fact is, Dad's been there for 50 years. He's in his 80s. He's developed this business. And I hear the town talking about fairness. And this is one of the big reasons why I think it's appropriate for them to allow him to put towers on this 351 Spurwink Avenue. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from the public? Hearing none, I declare that public hearing closed. Now we'll move on to council, please. Item number 91. The wish of the council. Madam Chair, I Councilor. just wanted to um, make a comment about something that Paul Stroud said. During our workshops, we were very sensitive to the comments made by Herb Stroud about um, not putting him out of business, so to speak, of his 50 years of having these towers. And the intent of 472 Spurwink has been, at least I, be I believe this is in the ten of, uh, intent of the council, for um, the town of Cape Elizabeth to have its own access point for public safety. 
Um, I, there really have not been any discussions about selling pieces of that tower off for commercial use to compete with Mr. Strout, but really to um, maintain our flexibility as it relates to coverage for public safety. And I can't promise you what the future holds, but that certainly is, has been the intent in our workshops of this council, is to use and have available 472 Spurwink, the Gullcrest property, for public safety reasons. We currently now have some issues with coverage. And from we spent $10,000, I believe, with a consultant who looked at our coverage issues where we have uh, spots where there is not any coverage, the impact of that on our public safety. And it was recommended that we consider 472 Spurwink. And I say it is with that intent that 472 Spurwink is in this proposal. And in fact, the original document did not have that in there. And the council went back and said, we want to keep the flexibility for public safety for the town of Cape Elizabeth. We felt it behooved us to um, protect our own public safety needs in that regard, but not as a way to compete with Mr. Strout on a commercial basis. And that was the intent. Councilor McGinty. Um, I'd like to follow up on what Bruce said. Um, the fact is that when the, the, the um, telecommunications task force did not recommend that location, um, and part of my decision is based on the fact that citizens in the, on that committee um, looked at various locations around town and did not recommend that as a location. I'm, I'm Se sorry, did not recommend Did not recommend it. Which? You, you kept saying that. Which? Which oh, I'm sorry, the, the transfer station area. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah, so that was the station. ordinance committee that met or the no, citizens? No, was the citizens committee mm -hmm. that met. Um, and second, um, I couldn't agree more with Mr. Danielson, you know, in a couple more items we're going to um, look at a conservation easement for the poor farm area. And right in the middle of this beautiful area, we're going to have this 180-foot tower sticking up there. And, you know, it may be a beautiful structure to some people, but I just think, I just think it's going to, it will become, the tower will become the focal point of that property. And so you're going to have this beautiful property, and you're going to have a great place to look at a big old ugly communications tower. Um, and so I, uh, I, I just can't support the overlay district, that particular overlay district of the transfer station. As far as the rest of the ordinance, I have no problem. But unless we remove that overlay district at the transfer station, um, I can't support this. Councilor swift Cahetta. Well, I, I agree with several other people that um, towers, in my mind, are not particularly beautiful. But I don't think that's really the question at hand here. I think that um, the federal government has dictated to us that we have to figure out where we can put towers or else they'll do the figuring out for us through, through the court system. We'll be sued and they'll plop down anywhere, maybe in a residential neighborhood, maybe up by Avon Road, who knows? But I think uh, we are trying to get ahead of the game on this, figure out some good spots for towers. As far as uh, the overlay district at the uh, transfer station site, I think it is appropriate to have an overlay district there for a couple of reasons. One is that the coverage provided to all of the town is, is best from that site as, shows, uh, as was shown by the consultant's report that we received. Secondly, I um, agree with Councillor Watson that um, we as a town, as, as councillors, we need to protect the, entrance, the interests of the town and the townspeople. And that includes uh, providing some options for us to have um, control over our own public works and public safety uh, facilities. Um, and for that reason, I think that would uh, be a good place for us to have our own site there. It's not saying we're going to put up zillions of towers, but we might. Um, thirdly, um, Mr. Strout has done an absolute wonderful job. Um, the guy's incredible from everything I've heard of how much he has contributed um, to uh, what's gone on in building towers and telecommunications in this part of, part of the country. However, I do not think, in the, um, as someone who represents the interests of all Cape Elizabeth residents, that we um, should restrict the overlay districts just to his property, because that would be uh, a government town-mandated monopoly for Mr. Strout, and I'm sure Mr. Strout understands that 
there must be other options available too. I don't want to take any business away from him, but I think the town uh, needs to maintain its options. And for those reasons, I uh, support uh, the, the town with both, uh, instituting both overlay districts as presented today. Um, before we come to a vote, I would like to talk about one other small item, but I sense there's other discussion that might take place. Is your item related to telecommunications yes. towers? Yes. Well, I think but it, well, it's t the technical language. There's something about the comprehensive plan. Um, we got a page on it, but before we vote, we, if you okay. we come back to that. But there's bigger issues to discuss right now. All right. Uh, Councillor Fritz. Um, I, I guess I agree with Councillor Watson and Swift Kayata in terms of the reasons why we do need to have a tower in this in this spot. I've I've wavered back and forth because I really don't like the idea of putting a tower <coughs> so exposed there. Um, but I think the public safety issues and the area of the town that just isn't covered um, it would be covered there. What I think we have to be very careful of, and the town will own, the, does own the parcel of land, so <coughs> we decide that it is only going to have one tower for public safety. And while I'm on the council, that's all <laughs> there would be. Also, I think we really need to explore um, design of any tower that goes there mm -hmm. um, so that we're putting up minimum height and, and that it's a design that is not, I mean, I think the scaffolding type of towers are the most unattractive and uh, I don't think we have to go that route. Even, even if it might cost a little bit more money, I'd like to look at something that is, is good design. Sure. I mean, they do have, trees and all kinds of things that are designed as towers. So um, I think we need to look at that closely. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Uh, there are dead spots in town that aren't covered by the Stroke property. So the town really does need to consider their own public safety communication tower on the uh, town property. It does not necessarily have to be 180 feet tall, though. I believe the report indicated that you could build the tower in such a fashion that you could extend on if you had to but you could start at 100 feet, 130 feet, or whatever you needed to get it to the point where it provided you with the coverage that you had to have. Uh, as far as Mr. Danielson's comments, I, also I agree with him. Uh, they, I don't think they're very pretty things either. In fact, looking out my back window, I have a, a, a very good view of the current existing large tower. It looks like it's sitting right on the back of the, uh, on the, on the landfill and about 100 yards behind the house when in fact it's way over on Wells Road. So that shows you how far they can be seen. The uh, concern that I did have and I addressed it to the town manager was just whether or not we could put any kind of a limit on the number of towers that any site could have. And the, the problem in trying to do that obviously is that <coughs> If you've got a, I think there are five towers on the site over there now, four of them most of us can't see, and they're just the one large one. So if you had, if they were all large towers, maybe you could say, yes, only put three, but um, I don't know how we could put language into the text that would uh, dictate how many towers could be there. Although I guess as one counselor, if I saw one tower after another starting to go up all of a sudden, I would be asking for a moratorium on them to, see, to come back and readdress that issue. I'm hoping that there won't be a real proliferation of them. They are not pretty. I don't care what anybody says. But thank you. Is there any more comments from the council? Any more discussion? Ready for the question? Oh, yes, you have your item. Uh, yes, this is just a small item, but it's uh, something I noticed in the language on the third from the last page, the background information page, third paragraph. Um, this language, I spoke with Maureen Amara about it. This language uh, was inserted before the second overlay district at the transfer site was put back in. Is it under um, recommended implementation steps? Is that the page? It's, uh, it, it's a page that says background information at the top. Oh, yes. Third paragraph down says the site at 351 Spurwink is expected to remain a desirable location, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. The second um, sentence says, additional tower construction in other locations in town should be permitted only where less visible types of technology are not feasible. 
I propose that we just replace that with another uh, sentence that was drafted by um, Maureen O'Mara because it refers more directly to the site at 472 Spurwing. The, the old language in our big copy here sort of implies that you could have mm -hmm, towers all sorts of different places, and I'd like to make sure it's strictly laid out in the comprehensive plan that we envision and them only at these two sites. So you have a, mem a one page memorandum in front of you that was um, put at your place uh, before the meeting started. And the line I would propose inserting there instead of the uh, one I just read was the transfer station site located at 472 Spurwink Avenue has been evaluated by a consultant and also appears to be a site which could provide wide coverage of the town. This is the language for the comprehensive plan which really must match up in intent with the language in the ordinance. So I would like to move that uh, we accept the um, proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance related to telecommunication towers and tower overlay districts, except that we insert the, this line in Maureen's March 9th memo instead of the line um, in the background information section. I second that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Yes. City Manager. It's my assumption that the motion includes the adoption of the overlay map as well, showing the, yes. Yes. Showing the zoning overlay districts. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Six, six to one. Thank you. This is the last public hearing. Uh, item number 92. Public hearing and consideration of a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommending a group use policy for Fort Williams Park. And uh, Paul Phillips, would you give a little explanation, a brief summary? I'm into brief, I'm into brief summaries. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Not that brief. Uh, in essence, the Fort Williams Advisory I mean, this group use policy was last revisited in 1978, and since then, uh, the town officials have uh, worked their way through everything, and it, it seems to be going pretty well now. But when we looked at the language today, uh, we felt it needed some clarification. So we went back in and rearranged, and thank God for cut and paste, because uh, we, we wound up putting a lot of the same language back in, but rearranging it so the average person could understand it. Uh, a uh, couple of the things that we did uh, differently. Are you, are you saying that, that the document we have is no longer the document that The document it is. that, which, what's the date of the document that you have? Uh, 315, 2000. They have the latest one. Oh, okay. This is it. Right. And it references on the bottom that it was last uh, revisited in 1976 and reaffirmed in 1978. So that's the latest in writing policy that we had. Uh, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have the right one? I just say you were quoting page two of the second paragraph. Right. Uh, well, I have a different one then because I have page, it's on the bottom of page one on mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, in essence, we, we just want to confirm that the town manager in certain cases and the director of public works has the flexibility to uh, make decisions on, on certain items. Uh, or, or their designee has the availability to make certain decisions. Um, and we just wanted to tighten up the language a little bit as far as, uh, at least on my page too, uh, uh, certain guidelines when you make a recommendation so that the public, anyone uh, requesting a usage uh, knows what the gu guidelines are and there was a pretty much of a, a mishmash before and we think we've straightened it out. So there's scheduling priorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, the commission shall review following information, pretty much the same as before, but it's a little neater now. And um, the, uh, a recommend, the commission may recommend that an event may be the, denied if one of the following findings be made, and that's pretty much the same as before. Uh, some of the areas that we did change, the um, reservation process for the use of the picnic area, it got the, those reservations should go through community services. I think phone calls go all over town right now, and they're sort of guided by hook or by crook back to community service. But, but anyone that wants to reserve uh, a large event should go through uh, uh, community services when they want the picnic area. The 
Fort Williams Advisory Commission is working on two additional sites to use as backup if the first site is t scheduled for that day. Uh, and I think we went over that briefly the last meeting that we had. Uh, we also touched on some school outings because every now and then there's a, a beautiful day in the spring where four or five school districts show up at the same day with a couple bus loads of children and we wanted to get the policy in writing so that town officials can send out notices perhaps to other school districts that we do have a policy when someone, a uh, different school district wants to use Fort Williams, they really need to let us know so that Public Works knows what's coming, the Rangers know what's coming, and we can manage the people that show up there. The, uh, we also uh, just briefly touched on uh, museum uh, bus tours coming in. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, but every now and then we'll get a phone call. Uh, how can you, can you arrange a tour of the museum? And those court, uh, phone calls should go to the museum personnel directly. Uh, we did make a change in the fee structure. Uh, as you know, we, will, we were charged over the last year or two to figure out ways to come up with uh, fundraising availability within the fort, and we didn't want to make any drastic changes, as you realize, but for vehicle intensive uh, events such as the car shows that we put on there. The old fee was $2 per vehicle. Uh, we recommended that we increase that to $4 for, per vehicle. Uh, and the people intensive uh, fee, which was a dollar, we uh, are recommending that we leave it a dollar. The only function it really affects is the uh, uh, 4th of July concert. And uh, we felt that that was adequate. Uh, and again, we wanted to leave the town manager with the flexibility to negotiate anything above and beyond that. And uh, lastly, the commercial use policy. I think we wanted to put it in writing the way we're doing it now. We really didn't have anything in the previous policy about what happens when a film company wants to come in and, and use the lighthouse to film a, uh, a, a commercial of some sort. And so we just wanted to reiterate that the town manager has the availability to negotiate uh, a price, a location fee. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're grateful for the work that you people did to organize the use of the fort for the organized events that come there. Remembering that it's still passive entertainment. You're not going to organize the rest of us, just these. That's right. <laughs> and also, I hope the council notices and, and the citizens that, that there is a, a clause on the bottom of this document that the advisory committee has worked on that if there's any part of it that doesn't work successfully or, or that there needs to be some change, that the, that the council, in consultation with the Fort Williams Committee, can make a change in, to amend this document. So is there anybody else who wishes to speak on the group use policy at Fort Williams? Thanks, Paul. Uh, hearing none, I declare that public hearing closed. And um, council discussion, please. Shouldn't be a discussion. Swift, uh, Councilor swift Kata. Nothing controversial. I just wanted to commend the committee. I thought you did a really good job mm. covering all the bases. I think it's really good to have this in writing to avoid conflicts with other school districts or other groups that may be coming in there. It just heads off some potential problems. Gonna make okay. Um, so I'd like to move that we accept the statement uh, that we'd ad adopt the statement of group and commercial uses for Fort Williams Park, Cape Elizabeth. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Councilor Fritz. I'm still having trouble with how the school buses are going to work if all single school buses can come without bring giving any notice, as long as there's only one from a school district. But if you know about five, then that would be the limit. Um, I think our intent was that we had, at, at the way it stands right now, we have no way of knowing who's coming. And our intent is to have the town in some way notify other school districts that if you're coming, please let us know. Uh, as it stands now, the, the rangers have the unenviable task of either telling people they can't stay or to move people somewhere else. So we're, what we're trying to accomplish is to at least let the school districts uh, other than Cape Elizabeth know that they need to call us. Uh, we arrived at the one school bus figure. Uh, I don't want to say we flipped the coin, but it's either one bus or more than one bus. And uh, uh, it, it has, it's not a problem 11 months out of the year, but it seems in May or June, for example, 
uh, we do get that. And uh, we did not make a scientific survey. We really went on the uh, advice of Director of Public Works, the, the, uh, the people that work in the fort, the uh, personnel, uh, Public Works people do a great job, and the Rangers. And they pretty much told us what the problems they were having. And they felt that the notification uh, by us to the other school districts, and if we can get return uh, notification by the school districts, districts to us would go a long way of, of solving what little problem there is in the park. Uh, so I don't have a, a, a formula that we come up with one school bus. Uh, it's sort of like an education process. Hopefully, after you notify schools, districts, within our two or three times, they'll know that they need to call ahead when they're having a field trip. Or, uh, hopefully. I mean, I think it's hopefully. Hopefully. I think what's education. happened over the last few years is there was no policy. Right. And they never told us. And there was one day last year when three different schools, uh, districts from as far away as, as Oxford County uh, came and just, you know, unloaded. And we're happy to have them, but we'd like some advance notice. And hopefully uh, uh, the school districts, uh, if you can use your own network, uh, right. let them know that you're more than welcome to come, but please let us know. And if it's a school bus is generally uh, 30 kids and a couple of uh, uh, chaperones, uh, that's manageable. But if we find, and if they do notify us, and we find that there's more than a, a few bus loads coming, then the park rangers have the availability to designate them to go at least unload in certain right. areas. If you want to come up with picnic lunches, they can even help them and set up picnic tables in advance, knowing that District 1 is, will put them over here and District mm -hmm. 2 will be up over there. Uh, and that seems to, it looks like it will work, but we won't know until right. we get cooperation. Dr. Fritz, you had another question? Well, it, it, it's just that if I got this no, a notice that was worded in this way, and it said that all groups exceeding one full bus load would have to give prior notice, I might say I only have one bus load. I don't have to give notice. And so several school districts or classes could think the same thing on the same day and you could get 10 bus loads there five of which may have given you notice mm -hmm. and five didn't it it just seems to me it would be clear if it was if it said all school group all bus loads of school groups shall give prior notice so well, that all of them would give prior notice and we, we tinkered with that, and the feeling was, well, you can have a, a van from Wainfleet with a 12-child outing. Our intent is not to force them to make a phone call that we're coming out here with 12 children. Uh, I think it would, it would go a long way if you worded your letter of notification that, you know, please let us know if there's any substantial group. But if, more, if we have a lot of bus loads coming in, then you need to have the ranger have the power to say, you know what? we're at eight or nine today, you didn't notify us, you can't stay. And by, by doing it this way, uh, if, if it is a larger group, if it is a full bus load, at least they have the flexibility. I don't see that happening. Uh, but, you know, there's always a chance of 25 vans coming in one day, and uh, hope they, hopefully they visit the gift shop. Right. <laughs> bring your wallet. All right, bring lucky your wallet smile. Spread them out. How lucky those children are from Oxford County that they have to come to us to see the sea. Well, that's, that's right. But it's only an hour ride, so it's, right. I've, I've taken longer rides than that. All right. Anything else? We, we put a motion on it. And somebody second? Yeah. I'm a second. Yeah. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? It's opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. That ends. The public hearing portion of our meeting this evening. We'll move right on to item number 92. 93, consideration of final acceptance of a parcel of land from the Cross Hill Development Corporation. Steve, are you going to speak on this? Okay. I'm going to ask Mike to point out on the map where this fabulous piece of land is that's being given to the town. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Back in 1972, I believe it was, the the town council in its uh, great, great wisdom formed a conservation commission. And Peter, Peter Rand is here this evening. I believe he was the first chairman of that well, conservation commission. Chairman. Second, who was the first, Peter? Oh, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Bill, Wad, Bill Wadman was on the committee, Nat Clifford, uh, Clifford, a few other individuals. And the town council at the time 
charge them with coming up with a green belt plan and really looking at what, what Cape Elizabeth could do to conserve its land uh, a little bit better than it had been doing up to that point. Well, this, this group, I think, has exceeded anyone's imagination of, of what possibly could be accomplished. And it, it's still very much a work in progress. But this evening, what you have before you is the acceptance, I think, of one of the, the most important parcels that has come about as a result of the vision that first began in 1972. And this is a donation from the Car Cross Hill Development Corporation, I believe is its name, uh, who they're developing the parcel of land up on Wells Road where 90 homes are going. In the past, uh, 90 homes would have been developed and there would have been no land set aside for conservation. I mean, when I say in the past, before the vision of the Conservation Commission came forward. As you look at this plan in, in back of me, virtually all of these purple spots here are as a result of the vision of the Conservation Commission and uh, in somewhat the land trust, a few of the spots, and looking at conservation land in the community. Obviously, this is Fort Williams, but all of this land here in the, the area between Mitchell Road and Fort Williams is all conservation land. And in fact, this exceeds the total amount of acreage in Fort Williams Park. Uh, we also have the land that the town purchased uh, in the area of the Levitt property and the rear of the school grounds, obviously the town farm, which will be a later item on your agenda, which was purchased from the Thomas Jordan Trust. Uh, there's some land over in the Elizabeth Farms area. And then there's this whole circle right here. Uh, up at the very top, you have land. We have land that was donated to us by a woman named Alice Lorea, uh, who uh, inherited the property from the Winnicks, uh, her mother and father. Uh, that's about 60 acres. Uh, this land right here, the lighter green, is land that is under the control of the people of the land trust that came from a, a family named Hinkle. The orange portion right there, which is on the corner of Sawyer Road and Pickett Street, is land that's owned by the federal government that came about as a result of their efforts to, to see that land improve. This evening, there's a really a fourth piece of land in this corridor. And it's all of this purple that you see here that connects beginning at about this point here. All together, it's about 100 acres. And what that does, it ties the upper part of Sawyer Road near the old Winnick property all the way down almost to Wells Road. And it, it does, in fact, connect on all publicly owned property between the roads and the conservation area. Uh, it's extremely significant for those of you that have been up in there. There's some beautiful lands there. And most of all, as you look at, if you look and uncover the Greenbelt plans, the original one and the one that have, have been on in the past, we get closer and closer to the vision of 1972 of having a connection from Fort Williams over to the town farm, over to Crescent Beach, and also having these other spokes going in a different direction. So this is a donation that is being offered to the town. Uh, from the Cross Hill Development Corporation. Uh, it's at no expense to the town. Uh, however, obviously, uh, we will own the land from this point on so that taxes won't be paid on it. And uh, I think it, it's really significant in terms of its future potential and all the other items uh, that the town has accomplished since the vision in, in 1972. So I would urge the council to graciously accept this gift from the Cross Hill Development Corporation. It has the standard conservation restrictions on it, uh, limiting what the town can do with the property to ensure that it does remain uh, in a uh, green and wild state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the parcel of land from Cross Hill. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion, please. Uh, yes, in addition to that, could we authorize the town manager uh, uh, to uh, execute on behalf of the town the real estate transfer tax document that must be filed in the registry of deeds with the deed to the property. Certainly. That's, I'll add that. <laughs> Who said? And second is good as well. Okay, fine. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. This is a wonderful gift to the town. And uh, pretty soon we'll see purple everywhere. Is that right, Dr. Ann? <laughs> Okay, um, item number 94, 
I, I think I'll give this to Mike and to Bob Danielson to speak on, to explain to members of the public and to members of the public that are at home watching on television. Item number 94, consideration of a proposed conservation easement, easement to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust on the town farm on Spurwink Avenue. Do you want to do this? Or? I will briefly. This is one of the, another one of these issues that's gone on forever. I think there's been years of frustration. The town uh, council has looked at development proposals for this parcel over the years. I think some of us may remember what the Jackson Brook Hospital, which is now Springbrook, or I'm not sure what the name of it is, was once proposed for this site. Mm -hmm. And it's always been recognized as one of the primary conservation areas in the community, one of the best scenic vistas, as was, as was, as was alluded to during the tower discussion. And several years ago, the town again showed some wisdom and purchased the land from the Thomas Jordan Trust thus uh, removing uh, the restrictions that it had to be used for the poor, and then the money went in, and there's still an account that helps out the needy of the town. Uh, anyway, the town council, about three years ago now, formed a committee uh, to say, now that the town owns the land with clear title, let's, let's try to make sure that we don't have any proposals again to develop the property. Let's protect the, let's protect the term, the property in the long-term interest. Uh, the committee that was formed by the council looked at two different ways of protecting the land. One was to develop a, a zoning district uh, particular to this property in order to protect it, and the other one was to give a conservation easement to a third party uh, that, would, that would ensure uh, that the land would be protected. Uh, the town council discussed this as an, at a number of workshops uh, over the last year, and uh, really at the, the very last workshop where the council as a whole discussed it, really strongly encouraged the staff to work with the land trust to come up with a proposal uh, that would uh, protect this property for, for an extended period. You might recall at some point the town attorney had some concerns about uh, some putting restrictions on town property. Uh, I had some concerns as well. Uh, the council, I think, heard all those concerns uh, gave them uh, a lot of consideration, and uh, you know, it was clear to me that the council wanted to have a, a clear option to look at for protecting this property. The easement that you have before you uh, offers uh, to the land trust, if you approved it, uh, the, the right of a conservation easement over this property. Uh, it is for a 50-year period. That ex uh, addressed some of the concerns both Mr. Leahy had, I had, and some of the councillors had in terms of uh, not forever foreclosing the town possibility. It also protects the town's rights in, in regard to the sewer treatment plant that's there. It, it protects the town right to possibly have underground utilities. Uh, but for the most part, and I think most importantly, it protects the interests that citizens have in ensuring that this land remain essentially as it is. And this conservation easement would clearly accomplish this and would, at least, I was going to say once and for all, but at least now for the next 50-year period uh, during uh, the time that all of us will be able to enjoy it over the next 50 years, uh, <laughs> will we'll definitely protect this land and ensure that that view remains and that it also remains a, a great place for wildlife and for, uh, for maintaining that uh, rural character of Cape Elizabeth that we all know and love. Well, I want you to know my plot at Riverside has a terrific view of this, and I expect <laughs> to keep that. <laughs> and Mr. Danielson, Bob Danielson, the president of the Land Trust, uh, worked with Mr. Levy on this as well as here. You can make a brief synopsis too, Bob. Right? Thank you, Madam Chairman. This, this is actually a great segue from the last item to this item. Right. This stuff is not purple and orange. This is all green, yeah. and it's going to stay green. Um, and the part that we're talking about is right here, this whole purple and orange, well, not the orange, just the purple area on the west side of Spurwink Avenue. And right now, we've got an incredible opportunity, okay? We've got an opportunity to show that Cape Elizabeth is serious about that rural character that Mike was talking about and protecting that rural character. We always talk about open space, but people look at open space and they say, oh, great, it's open until something better comes along. Well, this is the best that's gonna come along, and we need to do something about that right now to make sure that it doesn't get less better as time goes on. Uh, as Mike pointed out, in 1997, the town commissioned, uh, the town farm study commission to determine what should be done with this land. We're talking about right now, just the land over here that abuts the Scarborough National Wildlife Refuge 
And if you look um, at the red dots that run through, that's part of the Greenbelt Trail. A significant portion of the Greenbelt Trail actually runs this way and over this way. The committee unanimously endorsed the concept that the rural character and natural resources be preserved for future generations. And the word I underline is future, okay? Everybody knows it's beautiful right now. Everybody agrees that, gee, that's a nice thing to happen. What we've got to do is we've got to make sure that at a future time when our situation is very different, that we don't give in to the pressures of the time. Um, the Town Farm Study Commission based its conclusions on two things. The assessment of visual resources, which was the 1989 study, which gave this area's protection as a natural resource one of the highest priorities. It said, look, we're doing a visual catalog of everything that's important in Cape Elizabeth, and as a natural resource, this is as good as any, okay? The comprehensive plan took that and went one step further. The comprehensive plan says it encourages protection of this area through creation of a scenic conservation zone and the development of conservation easements. So again, the comprehensive plan, which we talked about earlier tonight, being consistent with the zoning, et cetera, is consistent with what we're asking for tonight. We've enacted the scenic zone. Very good job. I commend the council. Um, if you look to the zoning, it's clear that nothing is going to be developed in that area under the current zoning scenario. But we all know what happens with zoning, and that's why I'm here tonight. We can do better than that. We can show that this space is important as it is, okay? We can minimize the pressure to develop this land. And something very important to the council, and, and I know, is that we can create a trust that leaves the stewardship of this property with the town council. If you read the easement, the land trust is not looking for the typical holder rights to put trails and put signs and do all that fun stuff. All we're looking for is for the town to take away part of that bundle of rights that exists on that property to build other things on that property. The, the town is doing a great job of stewarding it. We don't want to take that over. We don't think it needs to be taken over. The town attorney and I went through this several times to, to make sure that what we're looking for is that we act as a passive holder of a, of a part of your bundle of rights. And the stewardship is going to continue to remain with the town council. The town council is going to decide what happens with the Portland Water District. The town council is going to decide what happens with parking. Um, and I recommend to the town council that at some point we look at parking because it's starting to, to erode a significant portion of the crest of that hill. Um, but what we're doing is merely placing it in a trust that we think is important for the preservation of that property as it is. Uh, the land has an incredible sense of special place. Um, I think if you stand on the crest of that hill at any given dawn or dusk, you'll know what I mean. Uh, you can see for miles, the, the air is crisp and clear, and I, I'd rather not see anything happen to, to impede that view. We read about all of our budding neighbors, the towns, fighting over smaller and smaller parcels of open space. We got the Cross Hill property, a great addition. Look at the, look at the purple, green, that goes from here almost all the way down to here. In fact, you can get the Wells Road and down. Um, this is one parcel that is a huge part of all that, and I'd hate to lose that whole connection, because if this, if this vision has been going on since 1972, to connect all this, which I know you can get, from Fort Williams Park to Jonesy's to the high school, over to the... Uh, town farm and beyond without hitting a public street. That's incredible. Um, I think we need to, to make that one of our highest priorities. Therefore, I'm urging you to support a 50-year conservation easement in the form that's before you, because once this property is lost, it's lost forever. God bless you. Thanks. Madam Chairman. Are you running for something? Because it, <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. Yes, Councilor Berry. Oh, is the public this is, it wasn't a public hearing. We just yeah, asked him to speak uh, on it. Uh, I mean, members of the public. All right. I, I would like to move that uh, the, the easement be, uh, that the town manager be authorized to execute the easement uh, of the town to the uh, uh, commission as uh, proposed in item 94. <clears throat> so, 
There's a second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion from the council, please. Councilor McGinty. Um, where does this leave the snowmobilers who use that property? Are they still permitted to use the, that? They're not uh, on the... Excluded. No, snowmobiles are still permitted to use the property. They're not listed. There are limitations AT. on motorcycles and other... AT. And how about, it says season, seasonal structures. I know that they build some bridges over are those... Those are okay. Talking about blinds, okay. duck blinds? No, 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 I'm talking about the bridges for the snowmobiles. Oh, yeah. Those are okay. All right. Councilor Watson. We spent a lot of time on the zoning ordinance for this property. Is I understand that, that the conservation, uh, the land trust is going to accept all of the regulations that we outlined in the zoning, is that correct? Yeah. All the permitted uses will be the permitted uses with, for the land trust? We really don't have any uh, enforcement rights. Uh, well, uh, other than the fact that if the town decides to put a 20-story structure there, we're, we're going to oppose it. Um, all of the stewardship, zoning, and other umbrella issues still maintain no matter who owns the property okay. or controls the property, but we're certainly going to abide by those. I have another question, too. Section 9D, the conservation easement is assignable but only to an ent entity that satisfies the requirements of section blah, blah. Can you explain that? Yeah. By law, the definition of conservation easement says if the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust no longer exists or no longer wants to hold the easement, it has to assign it to another entity that would be a 501c3, a charitable organization. Town Council has raised the issue that within that structure, the town is going to have the further right to limit who it is so that we can't assign it to the XYZ Land Trust. The town is going to say, no, we want the final say on who that becomes. And if, and if we do not like the transferred, the, the entity that's being transferred to, then it, the agreement becomes void and it, the, the rights then come back to the town. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. No, okay. We just have to come up with another 501c3 because by statute, you cannot have a conservation easement that doesn't end up with a 501c3. Okay. All right. So what, what, what the town would do is have the right of refusal. They would say, no, we don't want that. Come up with a better one. And for as long as it takes, the town and the land trust or its successor would work to come up with a successor group. But the land trust is not going anywhere anytime soon, and I think we have a sufficient enough endowment to last the 50 years. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other discussion? Councilor swift Um, Mr. Danielson, you've been very eloquent. I'm, I'm impressed by your efforts and uh, by those of the land trust. You've done a lot of good work in town. Um, I'm all in favor of not developing this particular property. I voted for the, the zoning uh, ordinances restricting the uses on it. Um, however, the actual motion today doesn't really address what we're going to be doing today. I have some concerns because it, it asks me to take away the power of my children and my grandchildren, who hopefully will be citizens of Cape Elizabeth, um, and future councils that they elect to do uh, with the property, what the town wants to do. Um, so I'm, I'm against it on that basis, not because I want to develop the property, but um, I'm against this easement for two reasons. One is, on principle, I think it's a matter of um, not a good public policy um, to set up things that really can't, uh, that restrict us this much. Even our, the U.S. Constitution can be, can be amended. Um, but more importantly than that, I, I'm against it because I'm not very confident about my ability to uh, predict the future. Um, I'm, I'm less fearful about this because it's 50 years versus the, you know, the rest of eternity, but I'm still not even very confident about my ability or, or anyone in this room's ability uh, up here um, to predict what can happen in the next 50 years and to think about what the values and the situations will be in the future. Um, and as evidence of that, I look at, I look at the town farm. A hundred years ago, going by the values, or, or whenever it was established, a long time ago, going by the values of the, of the time, it was set up that it should be a farm, a working farm forever for, for, to benefit the poor and the poor people should be working there. At least that's my understanding. And if we had had to stick to that for forever or for a long period of time. We wouldn't have the use of that property that we have now, the, the wonderful resource that it is for the town. So I think it's just poor public policy to tie the hands of future 
um, Cape Elizabeth councils and, and the citizens that elect them, um, if, restriction, if we place these sorts of restrictions on it, I'm just concerned that some situation, which I can't predict right now, something may come up in 2050 or 2040 that um, the people of Cape Elizabeth may want to do something about. I think the property is uh, fairly well protected with the zoning restrictions, and I have a lot of faith in the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to elect people on the council who will do a good job of managing this very important resource. So, so I will be voting against it for only for those reasons. I don't know whether to go. I'm going to go. Can I respond? Can I respond to that? Uh, I think I'd like to go to. I think I'd like to hear the council discussion for, since it's not a public hearing, unless they'd like to direct a question. Councillor Barry. Uh, well, we. Uh, discuss this at, at length in workshops over the last two or three years and uh, the, one of the objections was that uh, we not uh, part with ownership in perpetuity mm -hmm. or to part with part of the bundle of rights that Bob Danielson mentioned uh, in perpetuity and that's why uh, I think that we had settled on uh, going as far as 50 years but not forever mm -hmm. and I think that the matter of the, the town farm uh, conservation should be uh, assisted by an ordinance of this nature and take it uh, essentially out, in part anyway out of the political arena I don't think that uh, uh, this, this could develop into a political situation with future councils and I don't think that would be for the long-term benefit of the town I think that the property should be preserved as is uh, and the, the uh, conservation easement will ensure that at least for the next 50 years. And uh, I, I don't think that there should be any development or uh, anything. I, I don't think anybody thinks that now. But I support this because I think that the uh, land trust uh, is not going anywhere. And uh, this is a good idea to combine the town ownership with the conservation easement. And together, I think that's a good combination. Thank you, Councillor Fritz. Well, I, I don't think there could ever be a more important use as we um, than, than open space for the public. Um, as, as we develop more and more land, the open space is and having the ability to have recreation for, for the public is always going to be, I think, foremost. Um, I mean, I've been an advocate of, of having an easement that's limited to just have just the open space um, concerns belonging to the land trust and all the details the, the, the town council in future years can, can deal with, like whether there are snowmobiles and that sort of thing. Um, but I think that this has been a really good compromise the 50 years. Right. Um, I think it, I would love it to be in perpetuity, but um, because I think, I think that's the best thing we could do for the public. Um, but I, and one of the most important things has already been mentioned by a couple of people is that it takes that political pressure off. It doesn't have people who have um, <coughs> building proposals, fields, or whatever it is looking to this parcel, it simply would not be available. And, and that is a huge protection. It's important. So I will be supporting it. Councilor McGinty. I'll also be supporting it. I think in the future, and probably the, the near-term future, is going to be incredible development pressure in town. And uh, I mean, that mm. piece of property is a prime piece of property. Any developer will probably drool um, looking at that piece of property. Um, and I, unfortunately, um, I don't have the confidence in Anne has that future <laughs> councils will not turn it into a political issue in some way and, uh, you know, have developers try to take over the council or whatever. I mean, it could really turn into a, a, a political morass. So um, I won't be supporting this for that reason. Thank you, Councilor Roberts. Thank you. My preference, obviously, would have been to have a, a zoning ordinance that it would have allowed a 5-2 vote or a supermajority in order to make any changes. I felt that that would have made an issue it would have had been very strong in order to get a turnover. But I, I was told that the, uh, a 5-2 supermajority was tying the hands of future councils. Um, I'm not sure how this isn't, although I am going to support it. 
there were three issues that were of grave concern to me, and the land trust uh, lawyers uh, in the town have addressed those. I was concerned about uh, putting on an easement for perpetuity when we had just paid plus $700,000 to uh, take restrictive language off in it previously. I was also concerned about having a third party controlling the activity on the parcel. That's been addressed. And I did not like the idea of having the land uh, go to another third party that we had no knowledge of that could have been based in Washington or Oregon or some other state that had no interest in Cape Elizabeth. I also had proposed a potential amendment and had circulated it to councilors. I'm not going to bring that forward. I've checked and I don't have the votes for it. I was hoping we could get some language in there that would reserve a spot for the uh, future councils to at least uh, re, uh, take into consideration if somebody came forward like the uh, Nature Conservancy or the Rachel Carson to potentially rebuild a replica of the farmhouse and use it as a nature center. But I don't believe I have the votes for that, so I'm not going to push that issue. My other concerns were addressed. I will support it. Um, I do have some concerns in tying it up. and. But if we're going to have to, if we're going to do it, and if this is the only way of doing it, I'll support it. Councilor Barry, you had something else? I have already spoken, but I just as a comment, I'd like to remind the people who have been around this town for a while that in 1970 there was a proposal to turn the 90 acres of Fort Williams into high-rise housing, and that was a political decision. Where there was a lot of pressure putting on put on the council, and I was on that council, and I think that was a very bad move at that time, and I think this easement will protect the town from that kind of pressure, as has been uh, said. Uh, and I, by and I would use that example to prove, to <laughs> stand behind my point, which is that you and your fellow councillors withstood that pressure. I was the one you, swing vote. Well, you represented the citizens of the town very well. And um, I, I think that you've could just um, could have gone either contribu way. contributed to my point. I have a lot of faith in the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, the people's common vote. sense. and. Um, and the councillors that they elect. So I, I, I can certainly see I'm on the, the losing side <laughs> of this issue, but I'm also on the winning side because I'm in favor of not developing the property. So um, it's more my philosophy of not placing restrictions on the, on the future citizens of the town, not a lack of support for um, preserving the property. Councillor Watson. Madam Chair, I have gone on record on several occasions saying that I am against uh, turning over property that st we're still paying for the bond on um, to the, the land trust. Um, my basic objection was into perpetuity. The 50-year language um, makes a difference for me. I do have agree with um, Councillor Swiftke. I, I, I do think that um, when the citizenry of this town elects officials to sit in, in these spots, that you can feel pretty comfortable that those people are going to do the best they can to protect the interests of the town, and that includes open space. So I'm going to vote for this, but I'm not voting for it because I think that future councils may uh, fold under, under pressure to do something other than to protect this property. But um, the 50-year proposal versus into perpetuity makes sense to me. Um, I don't see anything in 50 years changing where we're going to have to do something other than keep it open space. And in 50 years, the councilors at that point can look and see if they want to renew a land trust relationship or if they want to take it back into their own ownership for whatever reason. So for me, this is a reasonable compromise. I don't think we're tying the hands of future, future councilors forever. And I think we're protecting a valuable resource. So I will support it. Everybody's heard from but me. <laughs> And there's no surprise here. I think you should tie it up for 300 years. So, <laughs> so uh, I will be supporting this. <coughs> and the, well, there's a motion on the floor. Mm -hmm. There's there a is. second. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any more discussion by the council? All those in favor? Yeah. What was the motion? What, oh, <laughs> <where are> we <laughs> that? We're authorizing the manager to sign the. Right. Okay. Nobody paid. Execute. Faith in that council. Well, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have, let's have a show of hands, please. Four. Yeah. Opposed? <coughs> one, one. <laughs> the lonely opposed. I admire you for sticking to your philosophy. Well, our philosophy is usually similar, except I wanted to tie everybody's hands. <laughs> I'm, I'm not horribly disappointed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. All right. Item number 95.
Did we lose a lot of people for this one? These must be people who were here for that, huh? It's a very big item, that last issue. <laughs> very big for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, what item are we on? Oh. Now, item number 95. Consideration of the report of the Fort Williams Park Charitable Foundation Study Committee. It is uh, appropriate to accept this report and send it to workshop. I move that we uh, accept it and send it to workshop. Second it. <laughs> I, I, I think we could ask, um, there's a lot of people that have worked hard on this, and we might let Glenn, Glenn uh, say a few words, at least for the work that you've done on it. And we do appreciate it. It was a very nice document. I, I, and you should, I'm good you're explaining it, because I didn't explain it to the public at all. I'll explain it very briefly, Madam Chair. Brief. That's what the lawyers always say. <laughs> um, basically, this, this document and this uh, committee was an outgrowth of a, a report done by the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Commission in 98 at the behest of the council um, to come up with some ideas for fundraising for the fort to eventually help make the fort self-sufficient. One of the suggestions was a 501c3 charitable foundation that could raise money to support the fort uh, maintenance and improvements in the future. Um, the council, upon receiving the report from the advisory commission, um, put together the Charitable Study Foundation Committee to further investigate the feasibility of the 501c3. Uh, what we have tried to do is lay out a framework for uh, forming the 501c3 and running the 501c3. Um, this is by no means the final uh, document. I think that uh, legal counsel for the town is going to have to have a, a lot of input in the, in the finalization of this. Uh, and probably another committee will have to be formed at some point to actually implement our suggestions in this report. But I think that we've uh, taken a great step forward from where we were uh, when we were given the charge by the council to prepare this report. And I want to thank all the members of the committee who worked on this report. Uh, it was a great bunch of people to work with. Everybody worked very hard. And I think we've uh, gone a long way in furthering this effort. Thank you very much, Glenn. And, and of course, the council thanks you. We're so fortunate in this town to have people that work so hard on these items to prepare these documents for us. We certainly appreciate your work. Thank you. Now, didn't we move this? Is there any more discussion by council members? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Now, the next items are... Um, Six, I guess, one, two, three, seven. four, five, six, seven items, all uh, from the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. It is, it, is, it is the way the procedure is set up. They make recommendations to the council. These are all for events to be held at Fort Williams. And so rather than take them up um, individually, uh, I'm explaining to the public that there are these seven individual items, all scheduling items for the use of Fort Williams Park. And I would ask the council if they would consider taking them up as a group. I so move. Second. I will read them to the record. Item number 96, consideration for the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for the Down East Foreign Car Show on September 10th, or a rain date of September 17th. Item number 97, consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for the Northern Sky Toys to conduct kite events at the park on April 22nd, April 23rd, June 18th, and October 8th. Item number 98, consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit use of Fort Williams Park for Cape Elizabeth Little League from April 15th to July 27th. Item number 99, consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for Engine One Company's annual art show on September 3rd, 2000, with a rain date up to September 4th, 2000. Item number 100, consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for Cape Elizabeth School's spring field days on May 30th, 31st, and June 1st, and June 2nd of 2000. Item number 101, consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for the Portland Symphony Orchestra concert on June 29th, 2000. Item number 102, 
consideration of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to permit the use of Fort Williams Park for a change of command ceremony on August 1, 2000 for the Portland Military Entrance Processing Station. Except for that last one, these are all, or actually this has been done before, these are all items that have come before the council before, and these are all organizations that have used Fort Williams Park before. So now we will address those as a group. We have a motion and we have a second. All, is there any more discussion? No. All those in favor? Madam Chairman. Oh, yes. I want to uh, briefly speak on two items. The, the one involving the military uh, change of command ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, that date is a little bit fluid, and uh, we received a communication from them on uh, Friday, I believe it was, that they may wish to change the ceremony to the 8th. So, you know, if in adopting that, if you would allow us some flexibility on that date, provided it doesn't interfere with another event, that would be helpful. Uh, I think we, we'll ask answer. the motioner to reflect uh, to uh, that back to the Portland, to the advisory commission. I, I amend See my the motion, motion to uh, He's not the motioner. Honor about, I did, huh? You didn't, no. You, you didn't do this one, Henry. It's did. hard to believe, but I think that Councillor Watson did it. No. Didn't you? No. It was you? Councillor Barry. Oh. Councillor Barry. <laughs> I thought for once. All right. He believed you, though. You can do it. Yeah, he did believe me. <laughs> yeah, could have, we could have fooled you. I don't get no respect. Um, <clears throat> hmm? I will uh, amend my motion to um, uh, allow fluidity here so that uh, <laughs> August, on or about August 1st, to be uh, determined by the town manager in uh, negotiation with the uh, Portland Military Entrance Processing Station personnel. Does that right. do it? We are taking them up at a block, and he has one more thing he wants the, to bring. The other point is on many issues you, you ask, you know, has the staff reviewed them? Do they have any concerns? And in, after this went to the Fort Advisory Commission, I did have a concern expressed on the Northern Sky Toys proposal from the Chief of Police, and that is that we have received complaints, and not specific to this event, but we have received complaints in the past about kites coming dive bombing onto people. Uh, that some of these kites are, are very large, very heavy, and that th there is some liability in terms of uh, when the kites uh, come quickly to the ground. We're not recommending that you not approve it, but we did want you to be aware of that concern, and it is something we'll watch very closely, uh, particularly because of the, the number of times that this particular entity has requested uh, formal kite uh, flying days. I'd like to raise my re usual point of the insurance policy provided by uh, the, the, the people for the benefit of the town for liability. It's a requirement. Case. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded with the uh, change to give some, some dates to the advisory commission if the last item does not settle on the August 1st date. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That was very nice that we did that as a group. <laughs> Item number 103. Consideration of a request from Sandy Dunham to change the name of the road that has been designated as Robinson Cove Road to Mars Cove Lane. Um, as information to the public, this is an item that was part of the, came from the 911 Enhancement Committee. Um, there were several road changes and many number changes done in Cape Elizabeth to provide for the 911 system coming in here. The all citizens that had any changes had an opportunity to appeal to the committee and this, these two citizen, groups of citizens have appealed to the committee and have not agreed on anything and is now before the council. The council, I will say that the council did not want to get into these issues, um, but that was the plan that if they could not, if the appeal process did not work that they would come back to us. Out of all of the items, this is the only one that has come back to us. And um, I have to say to the two families involved that this is extraordinarily difficult for the council. Um, um, we have a handout. Please. We have a handout. There was a letter that came to the council regarding this issue. I think you must have seen it at your place. Did you see it at your place? Your seated place? Yes. yes From Frank Stroud? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that came today or yesterday. Uh, no. Right here. Oh, I do. All right. Mrs. Dunham is going to speak first on this, and, and I will allow other speakers on this, of course. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Chairwoman Carson and members of the town council, uh, my name is Sandy Dunham, and I'm here tonight uh, with my husband, Tom, uh, to ask your help in resolving uh, the differences between our neighbors, uh, Frank and Nancy Strout, concerning the naming of our driveway off of Shore Road. And before I go any further, I would like to say that this has nothing to do personally uh, with the Strouts or their family. Uh, we've enjoyed really good relations with them for over the 20 years we've uh, lived there. And our children have grown up together, and our daughters in particular are very good friends. So it's nothing uh, personal. And I do appreciate you uh, hearing uh, me tonight. This is sort of a last step uh, attempt to say <clears throat> um, to have a say in what our new address is going to be when the new enhanced 911 addresses take effect in September. Uh, we had planned to be here last month, but after talking to some of you on the council, um, I tried to uh, talk to Frank the night before and understood, I understood from our conversation that he was in fact willing to get together with the committee, uh, maybe not with the committee, but if we we, with the committee, came up with an, another name, totally different name, he would be willing to consider that. And then I guess I, I did misunderstand him because he said later that that's not what he said and that's not what he, he meant. And they really wasn't willing to compromise and consider anything but Robinson Cove Road. So um, I know that the council would like for us to work things out and I wish that we had been able to do that and wouldn't have had to come here. Um, but in the, this last month, uh, Tom and I have uh, gone to the Historical Society. We have brainstormed, written down lots of names and what have you, and I did, we did choose three and send them to uh, Frank and Nancy for their uh, response. And um, when I called Frank about that, he said no, he wasn't interested in any of those names that were suggested, and he was still wanting to have the road named Robinson Cove Road. Consequently, we're here at the suggestion of the 911 addressing committee to ask for your guidance and help in resolving this issue. Uh, we are of the opinion that a more historically correct name for the driveway would be Mars Cove Lane. Our driveway and property is located at 1182 Shore Road, and you can see on the photograph, um, this is the corner <coughs> where um, the Strouts live, and then our house is, the cottage is right down here on the shore. Uh, we bought the cottage about 20 years ago and have lived there about 15 years. And about five years ago, we reluctantly um, decided to move to Yarmouth. The cottage was getting too small, as we have two children. Um, other land uh, next to our property was not available, and we also have a son with special needs. And we felt that um, the services that Yarmouth had to offer at that time were what he needed. So we reluctantly did move. We because we really love living in Cape Elizabeth, we decided to rent out our cottage and uh, keep it with the idea that when the kids get out of uh, school, out of high school, then we would return to Cape Elizabeth and then we would do something with the cottage. And um, a couple of years ago, we were able to buy land uh, adjacent to our property and plan to come back in, in two or three years and build a house there. Um, to get to um, our cottage, we travel, travel over a private right-of-way, which you can see here. Uh, this is the right-of-way. Our house, the cottage is here. Uh, Frank Strout's, uh, the Strout's house is here. Uh, there are a few other families that, this is a private right-of-way. The other families that have right-of-way there are the Heffenreffers, the Strouts, the Partridges, the Turrets, the Cutlers, and us. And since we're not uh, living in Cape Elizabeth this, at this time. We did not see the announcements in the Cape Courier uh, in September when the uh, proposed 911 names were uh, printed. And if we had, we would have applauded the committee for doing some research and suggesting Mars Cove Lane for that driveway. Uh, this is the name of the cove that's directly in front of the cottage. As you can see um, on this map, there, were, there are two maps here, actually. One's from 1897 and one's from 1908, and they're from the Cumberland County uh, records uh, at the Cumberland County Courthouse. Um, following the notice that was in the paper, uh, Frank contacted the 911 committee and requested that the name of the driveway be changed to Robinson Co. Road. 
uh, saying that he owned the road and he wanted to name it Robinson Cove Road. And that statement's not entirely correct because while Frank does own a portion of the right-of-way, which leads off a shore road, uh, we also own a portion. Technically, probably, they own this about 60%. We own about 40% of the road, so there, it's, we, we also own part of that road. Um, and we also contribute to keep through the upkeep of that road and have since, uh, since we've lived there. Um, and as it turns out, our property is the only address that's going to be affected by the name change of the driveway. Frank um, and Nancy have their main entrance onto Shore Road, so they'll return, retain a Shore Road address. The Partridges, who built a house right next to us um, and currently are accessing their house off of the right-of-way, have decided that they would like to retain a Shore Road address, and they're going to go through the proper channels uh, to do that and, and have their entrance and their address be on Shore Road. Uh, we were not aware of the Enhanced 911 Committee's work until we received a letter from them on November 9th saying that the proposed, they were making a change in the proposed uh, name for the property, and they were recommending Robinson Cove. Cove Road, and we had some concerns about that to contact them by November 12th. So on the 11th, we did uh, contact them and give them a letter. Somehow our tax bills always managed to get there, but the notices from the 911 committee didn't. Um, so not knowing the committee's original um, name for the road, we did some uh, research, and we had come up with Mars Cove also. Um, in researching history, we found that uh, there was a John Marr, uh, born in 1752, who was listed in the 1790 census in Cape Elizabeth. He married Sarah Jordan in 1779. And in the 1970 census, he, a 1790 census, he had living in his household three free white males, 16 and over, three white males under 16, and four free white females. Uh, he also served as selectman from 1970. 1796 uh, and, and 1797. And I can only surmise that perhaps the Mars had a, a cottage or a house um, in front of that cove, and that's how it became known as Mars Cove. Uh, our first preference would be to retain a shore road address. And the enhanced 911 state guidelines on page 64, number 5, state that a long driveway with only one house at its end might be named if a potential exists to erect additional structures along the driveway. The committee has interpreted this to mean that even though we plan to put one house on our two properties and we will be the only ones with the address on that driveway, that the driveway must be named. Therefore, we think it's only fair that we should have a say in what the name should be. Uh, we recently, we respectfully request that the town council reconsider the name Robinson Cove Road, which was presented to the committee in November, and adopt Mars Cove Lane, the committee's original recommendation for the driveway, for the following reasons. Historically, the cove was referred to as Mars Cove, as indicated on the maps from the records of the Cumberland County Courthouse. Uh, there's no evidence that the cove or area was ever called Robinson Cove. Uh, the address for our two parcels will be the only ones affected by the new address. Um, the <clears throat> driveway is part of a right-of-way, and the use of road might indicate that, that it is, in fact, a road, and even more people will come down there to sightsee and just look around. And turnaround space is very limited, so we strongly urge that that the word road not be used. Uh, the Robinsons have been in Cape Elizabeth for many, many generations, and I certainly believe that they should be honored in some way. I've been told by the 911 committee and town manager that there's at least one public street available, uh, the street that goes offshore road next to the community center that could be named uh, Robinson Road, and I think this might be a more fitting tribute to the Robinsons than our dirt driveway. Lastly, if you were in our situation, wouldn't you want to have a say in what your future address would be? We fully support the original um, intention of the Enhanced 911 Addressing Committee to commemorate historical landmarks and believe that naming our driveway Mars Cove uh, Lane fulfills that objective. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. Are there any questions? Yes. 
Could you state what your objection is to Robinson Cove? I, mean, I, I wouldn't mind if you change it to Robinson Cove Lane, but take road out and change it to Lane, but what's your objection to Robinson Cove? Well, we think that, um, one, we really wanted to have a say in what the name was. Right. Um, and his, if you look back into the records, historically, that road leads to Mars Cove. Right. Uh, that, and it was known as that in the early part of the 1900s. I guess the only thing I can say is that I, I just think it's a, a pretty sad state of affairs that, you know, that you guys can't agree. I, mean, I, we were here I, I agree. A, a month ago and having a discussion. Now, granted, you weren't here, but... That's because I thought, I sincerely thought we were going to be able to get together and work it out. I, I really did, and I hope that we wouldn't come to this. Well, I wish you could agree, because I don't know how the council's going to name a road <laughs> for you. I mean, I, we've got two parties who want two different names, so, I mean, maybe we choose Westcott because that's a, ne a name next to it, and it could be Westcott Lane. I don't know, but I don't think there's any winning here. There's, it's a no-win situation if you guys can't come to terms. I'd like an opportunity for the Strouts to speak. This is not a public hearing. This is just a presentation mm -hmm. on two points of view, if the Strouts would like to speak at this time. So the council has both opinions here. Madam Chairman, members of the... Town Council. My name is Frank Stroud. I live at 1184 Shore Road. You received a mailing the other day, which uh, I think sort of depicts uh, the fact that I do live on Robinson Cove Road. Uh, my driveway uh, does come down uh, and enters my house. About a year ago, I, I put in a new driveway, um, which is probably where this whole situation ended up by going, was that uh, uh, therefore, it was felt that I didn't live on the road anymore, therefore I shouldn't have a, have a right to, to actually name it. But I, too, am very sad that this, this, this has come to this point where it's going to have to be before the town council to decide this. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, take a look at the uh, property maps I sent you, and as you can see that I, too, live on Robinson Cove Road. At the previous council meeting, I believe some of the councilors had the impression that that was not the case. What we are proposing is simple. And I believe that this will s settle the road issue. As far as what you can see from the maps, we have two driveways, one on Shore Road, the other on Robinson Cove Road. We have spoken with the U.S. Postal Service, and they have told us that if we wanted to change our mailing address to Robinson Cove Road, we would be able to. That being the case, and if the addressing committee agrees, we would then live on, own the majority of, and I know Sandy had 60-40, but it's actually 80-20, but that's all right. Uh, we also maintain the road pay the taxes on, have lived there for 350 years. And uh, this is what I think is uh, the most important part, that we will be the only people currently living on the road um, that are uh, property owners. Uh, the uh, partners haven't moved in yet, and the Dunhams are currently living in Yarmouth. Um, and, and our address would change, too. It would now become one or three Robinson Cove Road. Uh, at a time when Cape Elizabeth is struggling with preservation of its history, whether it be be, be a, a building or land, here's an opportunity to do just that. We can name it Robinson Cove Road. Um, I hope you'll support the 911 Addressing Committee's recommendation of, of Robinson Cove Road. And to, to give you just a little brief history how this whole thing came about was when the development next to my property, there was a three lot subdivision, the planning board asked me to name that road so it could be on the records when that development went through. Uh, I filled out a form for Maureen, the name was Robinson Way. That Robinson, stood what? Robinson Way. Way. That stood for uh, until the 911 addressing uh, committee came out with uh, the uh, report in the Cape Courier, where it was Mars Cove. Where it got transferred, I have no idea, uh, but it did happen. And uh, so that's when I, I called Maureen and wrote to her and asked her what I should do. She said, "Get in touch with the chief." Uh, Pickering, and uh, he was the head of the uh, 911 addressing committee, and that is what I did, and uh, reinstituted the name of Robson Cove Road, going through the process of it. Um, and again, I, I'm sorry that it's come to this point where we're here before the council to settle this kind of an issue, but uh, I guess we look to your guidance. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Madam, can I ask? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into debate. I just want to report. But fine, go ahead, Councilor Watson. I have a question: Would you consider Lane changing road to Lane? Yes. I, okay. Originally, I, I wanted Robinson Way, but Lane and that, would be. And you um, are going to change your address from Shore Road to Robinson 
Cove or whatever, whatever the name of that street is, you're going to change your address off a shore road address to Robinson Cove or I'd whatever? I'd be more than happy to. Or Mars I'd be Cove. honored to. Or Mars Cove? If the council decides it would be Mars Cove, you would no. change your address? No, I would not. I, I just I have no interest in living on Mars. And, and, <laughs> and um, I would I just ask <laughs> Councillor um, Watson's question that she asked of the other party, what, it, what is your objection to Mars Cove Road or Lane? It was just that. Uh, originally, <clears throat> the road that I live on was known as Zeb's Cove Road. If you go back in, in history, that is what it was always called. The, the road that the 911 committee named Zeb's Cove Road was always known as Moody Lane. Uh, Mars Cove was, if you ask, and most people in town had never even been heard of until this, this map appeared. And, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at it, and it, and it is there. It does state that it's Mars Cove. But actually, that, lo that road that, I'm on, that I live on now was originally known as Zeb's Cove Road. <clears throat> but to clarify, Zeb's, Crowd, Zeb's Cove Road is another road. I know. Oh, yeah. okay. I just gonna yeah, say it, it does okay. exist. <laughs> exists further up here a little bit. Well, so, there's a so you can't use Zeb's Cove. So don't think about that one. Uh, Do you? This isn't a public hearing. Oh, I know that, but I just I was over there and I figured I got to figure out how to write this up anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, for the Courier and I think your American Journal, whatever. Is this possible? And I mentioned it to Frank, and I just thought of this. Is it possible to have Robinson Cove Road or Lane? And then their driveway is Mars Cove Lane. They both get their name. They both get the road. 911 says, where's Mars Cove? You go down Robinson Road, and it's right there. They both win. Amen. Carl, I'm not sure if it's a help or a complication. I'm really thinking this one through. They both win. I move. Whatever Carl said, I agree with. <laughs> All right, we're going to close public comment right now because this isn't a public hearing, and we're going to go directly to council comment. Councilor McGinty. Well, both of these people want to keep their current addresses. Why don't we just let them keep their current addresses? They both want Shore Road addresses, right? I don't think that there's, there's actually a reason why the road, the dirt road that we're talking about, cannot have that Shore Road address. I believe it's because there are actually two lots, two lots. at the end of that road. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you can't have two lots at the end of one road, um, you know, without a, name. And without a name on it. I'm afraid that might, yeah. I, I understand what's going on with, you, yeah. with this, and, but I'm afraid it might create, it might open a giant can of worms for us. We might be getting all sorts of other people um, from town who are in similar yes. one or two house lanes suddenly coming to us and say, but I want to keep my Shore Road address. And I think we might be creating more problems. But it's a creative idea. You know, take into consideration the number of roads and numbers that were changed to, to work through this 911. Having one, I suppose, is not, the odds are not bad. It's, anyway, Councilor Fritz. Well, I'm just thinking if, if the council says it will not be Robinson Cove Lane and it will not be Myers Cove, you two get together and figure out something else. That's an incentive, at least, for you to get together and talk, because one, one doesn't want to talk because they've already got it on the books. So, you know. I will say in response to that, that, um, well, anyway, we'll see, we'll see what the council says. <laughs> Full council before I speak. Council yeah, Roberts. Yeah, one resolution to this would be to have the Dunham's put a restriction on that property that it just uh, combine it into one lot that could not be subdivided. Then they, they retain their Shore Road address and the Robinsons retain their Shore Road address and we can rename another road Robinson Lane in memory of the history of the Robinsons. Mm. I'm not sure if it's something they'd be willing to do, but we could ask. Okay, well, we're not going to ask right now because <laughs> we're not going to debate across the uh, table here. Anybody other councillors? Uh, Madam Chair. Councillor Webb. Do we know if um, Carl's proposal is feasible? Is it, is it possible that it could be Robinson Cove to Mars Cove? Didn't they try to do something with Leiden Lane like that where it, mm. it changed? And, and they wouldn't and let them do it? The addressing committee said, no, you can't have 
what is physically one road suddenly change name partway through. So, that, yeah, although it's a good idea, it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to really lead the council. I must say I came up with a rather large list of names when I arrived here, however. Um, I, I feel that we're at a stalemate here, and I think that our options are slim. We can choose to go with Robins Cove Road. We can choose to go to Mars Cove Road. Or we can choose being in fact that the two citizens when we look at the two taxpaying citizens, that's all I'm looking at, two taxpaying citizens. And my position is that we should try to be fair. I mean, our job is to be fair when we set public policy. And um, it seems to me in our last discussion that we talked about the fact that if the two citizens groups could not come forward in some agreement, that we would have to come up with a name, which was clearly something we did not want to do. But if that is the way the council goes, I certainly would say right now, either we do it tonight or we do it later, come up with a name. But if we do, it is not a debatable item. I would recommend that it not be debatable. We're not going to name it, you know, Dirt Pot Road. We're going to try and use some, you know, common sense about uh, blending the historic, you know, whatever it is, the same criteria that the, that the 911 committee did. But if that were to be the way the council would go, I, I would recommend that it not be debatable. I don't know if we can do that, but um, I think that we have, there has been ample time to come up in some agreement. Uh, we did talk about the fact that it have, the roads should have some historical significance, or possibly because it's a road by the sea, that it should have some significance to historic items of the sea. Actually, what I did is I called up a friend of mine, and I had him get out his uh, naval sea charts on the coast of Cape Elizabeth, and between, Pond Co <laughs> between Smuggler's Cove and Zeb Cove, I had to come up with every rock, reef, <laughs> uh, whatever there was out there. I said, stand on the line, look due east, what do you see? And he gave me. <laughs> you earned your counselor's pay. He, he gave me several names. Now, it's up to the council, I think, to decide which option do you want to go with. Do you want to take one of those names and go with them? Do you want to come up with a new name? Do you want to? up with the name tonight. What is it that you think you'd like to do? Does anyone have an opinion on that? Councilor Watson. Madam Chair, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, we are supposed to be fair. And we can't, I mean, the, if we choose Morris Cove or, or Robinson Cove, mm -hmm. we're taking sides with one party or the other. And I, I don't, I don't, we can't do that. We, you know, we can't. I, I just don't see how we can do that. So I, I think that we, you know, we, we've been at this for a while now, two months at least, and, and, and more than that before that. So I think that we tonight pick a name, and that's the name. Oh. I agree with Councillor Watson. You agree, Councillor swift -Gatta? I I agree with that, that we just pick, option. That, that, that concept of we just pick a name. My only, my only question with that is uh, it's probably a name we need to run by the addressing committee to make sure it doesn't conflict with something sure. they That's may true. have. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. We, we, could, we could prioritize, you know, pick our first, second, or third choice or something like that off of Penny's list, or we could go with Westcott or Noise or whatever, and as long as there's no conflict, just that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Help. I think I hear a council consensus to name it neither. Yeah. On that, to what? To name it neither. Oh. You know, like Councilor Fritz, I think, enunciated that fairly well. Uh, you know, with that, you know, I would think that you'd want to table this item to next month with that understanding and that the uh, 911 committee would make a recommendation based on Penelope's list and with consultation with the neighbors, but that with a clear understanding that at the time the recommendation comes forward, you will give reasonable weight to the 911 committee's recommendation. And, well, I'm and that it would be neither, and that it would be neither Robinson nor Mike. I'm, 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 I'm suggesting that only because I think that's what I hear the council saying, and I'm just suggesting an administrative process to move that forward. I, I, I'm reluctant to send it back to the committee. I agree with Penny. I'm, they, it's, it was there. They gave it to us. Yeah. We're going to hand it back to them. I, I don't think. But with an know. instruction that it be neither name. I don't know. Um, if that's. But, the, but that's their job to, to name. I mean, if this was a new road, they'd have to sit down and name it too. So I mean, that's the responsibility to select names. Well, I, I the only thing I'm concerned about with the committee is that it's sort of been through the committee two or three times. It seems like it just keeps looping around, and. Um, 
but with these I, names. And they'd have take these names oh, out of the mix. Oh, uh, okay. I, then I understand that. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. As long as it comes off of Penny's list or so, somebody's list, just not those things. Not mine. I just prepared in case we did it here tonight. As a matter of curiosity, would you read your list? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. And I don't want the two citizens to get excited now. It just, <laughs> you know, this was a list that came, he's just reading across the chart yeah. from me, you know. Well, one was Taylor Reef. Taylor Reef actually is further south, the, I mean, the, the, the stone reef and stuff. Now, growing up in my day, it was frequently called Becky's Cove. Becky's Cove. After Becky Jordan, whatever her name was. Um, Mars Cove, I like that. This was the one that the chart reader had very strong feelings about. It was a rock. It's called Willard Rock. It is a green, gong, a green number seven gong buoy direct east off that piece of land with a four second light. It is a real obvious thing. What's it called? Willard Gong? Willard Rock. Oh, Willard, Willard Gong. I mean, it's on the chart. Okay. It's Willard Rock. Um, Given the fact that Becky's original name was Jordan, we talked about Jordan Ledge. We talked about, uh, on my way driving home tonight from work, I came up with Whaleback, which I then changed to Whale Boat, because I thought Whale Boat was more obvious than Whaleback. Right. Um, that's really as far as I'm prepared to go with the list of names that came off the chart. I'm glad you weren't on that committee. <laughs> Listen, I was trying to find things completely unrelated. I thought I did well with Becky's Cove. Her name was Becky Jordan. Oh. So, uh, all right, let's see if we can move this along. And, and I think, yeah? Excuse me. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Could we give a, a time limit to the committee, give them direction as to? Next month. Next I think it should be, wing? yeah, I, I am. Um, because it's dragging on for everyone involved. April meeting. Councilor Fritz. I, I'm just wondering, if we do not allow either of the two names, could you get together, the two parties? Uh, and I then... The I don't know about I, I'm a little concerned about asking the citizens to do that. We've asked them three times, and it hasn't worked well. I think, I mean, I'd be happy if that was going to happen, and I wouldn't want to think that citizens right. couldn't do it. Right. But there are some times when it just doesn't come together. That's why we have courts. I, so. I think the two parties involved have come to us to ask for guidance, and I think yeah. it would be good of us to provide them guidance and withdraw them from the situation a little bit. All right. Is this where the council is? The, where at this time, the council is not going to pick Robinson or Mars, and that they are going to recommend it go back to the uh, 911 committee. I don't think they'll be happy to see it, but that's OK. That's what you're, seems to be a consensus to send it back there. With your list. And then, yeah, and then what is going to happen is the, the 911 committee is going to make a, re make a recommendation to the council, and this is a debatable item. Are we back into this again, or is this going to be the name of the road? How do you want to handle this? And are they going to? I mean, would they, the 911 committee can make a recommendation. The citizens have an opportunity to appeal it, and we're back, you know. Yeah. So. We, it, we will, working with the 911 committee, try to reach an agreement that everyone agrees to when it comes to the council. That everyone being be the goal. Everyone being the two citizens groups, or everyone's being the council. The three citizens who are involved and in the uh, the committee itself. One request I would make is that it not be a public hearing. That when it comes to us, we we decide. Just a regular that, council. It, item. It's an item. This is it. Get the votes. We either have it or not. If we don't, it goes back. But I think that it's not public hearing. At that point, yeah, when we get it, no, when we get it, that's it. So, I mean, and it has to by next, by April. And in April, we'll decide. And so I think that should encourage the parties to come together and work at something with 911. And if it doesn't, then everyone's going to have to be satisfied with whatever we come up with. Okay. I think that's possibly a workable thing. Seems to be the fairest thing. I know that the council last time, time before, and this time, has felt constraint because they want to be fair to everybody, and yet there are two equally tax-paying citizens here that we just need to try and make this fair as possible. Although I don't think there's anyone in the council that truly understands exactly what's happening and why there isn't any agreement. This is, I think, where it's going to go. I think we'll have a motion then. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to 
take this item, send it back to the 911 committee, and have the response for an item on our <coughs> April agenda. Second. So somebody should move it <laughs> besides me. Oh, you moved it. Second. Okay. Councilor Fritz and somebody second it. Councilor McGinty. Any more discussion? Are you sending your list to the committee? Well, I prepared my list uh, <laughs> simply as I was coming home in the car, you know, talking to him on the telephone with his charts. In case we had to do something tonight, I wanted to be prepared. I thought whaleboat was pretty good. <laughs> well, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> so, did, so he's got the list that, you know, I didn't think Willard Rock with his, with its its four-second light buoy was, didn't seem to work too well with the people out there, but Councilor Watson. Uh, one, uh, just one thing. Um, I would like to see, I don't know if we can consider this, but I thought naming the road that goes by the community center, Robinson Road, or Cove Road, was a good idea. I don't know where that stands in all of this. My, but. I only have my own personal opinion, which I've had for quite some time, and that is that, and I say this to the, to publicly, and that is that Robinson is a name that we should consider for something in the town of Cape Elizabeth. I, I've always been reluctant to use it on a dead-end dirt driveway that nobody's going to see. It wasn't my decision or my choice, right. but I do have some very strong feelings about it, and I, and I had hoped that we would be able to use it in one of our town center parks. Yeah. So that, that would be my preference. I like that idea better, a park. Yeah. Well, we have two options here, a couple of options that we've been talking about a park. But, so that was my position. Councilor swift -Piatta. I just have a question. I've sort of forgotten what the motion was. Did the motion also include that it will not be either Robinson or yes. Marco? Okay. The motion, as I understand it, is that this will be going back to the 911 committee. At this time, we are recommending to them that it not be Robinson Cove Road and that it not be Mars Cove Road, and that they have actually just a couple of weeks because we have to prepare it for the April agenda. And that they will bring it back, and Just that we that will we vote. Just bring back a name, and we will vote. <laughs> I would say a name. Okay. Hello. Call the question. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? I'm not sure that this makes the citizens happy, but I think that the council really, truly, as you can see, did not know quite the best way to do this. Thank you. Um, Be sure and get your binoculars out there and start looking for Willard Rock now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Willard Gong. It's going to be Willard, it's gonna be Willard Gong. Willard though, Gong. Huh? <laughs> yes, with a four-second four light and a gong. Uh, All right. <coughs> Bob Malley's still here? Yes, he yeah, he's there. <laughs> we are on item number 105, consideration of a proposed scope of services. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, no, no. Oh, appointments. We're over to... Councilor swift this, Item number 104, consideration of a report of the Appointments Committee regarding a vacancy on the Recycling Committee. Um, I just wanted to let you know, um, Marianne Levitt has resigned from the Recycling Committee. Uh, the Appointments Committee has um, decided that we would like to recommend a person that Larry Glantz, the chair of Recycling, has come up with. That person's name is Edward Robinson. He seems very... Well, Dr. Edward Robinson, different, different family. <laughs> yes, different, different, <laughs> no Robinson Cove person or anything, just Edward ah. Robinson. Um, and so we are recommending that um, Edward Robinson fill, I'd like to move that Edward, Edward Robinson fill the uh, vacant spot on the recycling committee. Second. second. You decide who seconds, Debbie. Okay. So that's a very good choice for that committee, and, by the way. And if I could make one short announcement about appointments we also I also just found out that Kate Collins on the family fun day committee has resigned because she has moved to another town so I would invite citizens to apply for that open spot on the family fun day committee um, send your applications either to Barbara Ray at the uh, town mm -hmm. office or you can apply on the website thank you that's a motion, right? You made a motion? Did you make that in the form of yes, a motion? Yes, the motion was so before move that a second. Comment. Right. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Now, get my check marks going here. Item number 105, consideration of a proposed scope of services for repairs to Two Lights Road. I think we had a pretty good uh, understanding of what it is. I'll ask Bob, or shall I ask you, Mike? I'll ask Bob. That would be fun. 
Yeah, well, Bob's looks a little surprised. Oh, that's Two light roads in tough shape. Uh, fortunately, the state has set aside eighty thousand uh, dollars for us to pave it. Back when the council rejected the bikeway proposal, a number of councillors said, "You know, we didn't want the full blown everything that the feds require, but we do recognize that we ought to enhance the shoulders a little bit, particularly along the strawberry field." Uh, so anyway, we asked uh, OS to look at how much that would cost. We have all these numbers before you. Cost a little bit more money. Uh, the without that, it's about eighty-two thousand. Uh, based on the OST estimate, uh, with that it, it adds more. Uh, I think the memo is self-explanatory. I'm trying not to repeat all the numbers because I know you can all read. But uh, you know, <laughs> if you. if you wish to do, I have concern with OST estimates too, as my memo indicates. I think since they they only did it two weeks ago, but a major component of paving costs is petroleum generated. It's the, the trucking of the pavement material as well as the petroleum that goes into the pavement itself. And I don't want to have to come back and ask for more money because we, we didn't recognize that the world has changed over the last month. Uh, I believe we should ask MDOT to uh, raise the project total amount to $110,000 and that if the council wishes to uh, add the shoulders that it should be an additional uh, 10000 as well. So either I'm recommending either uh, 110,000 or 120,000 if the council wishes to show. Madam them. Chairman, I make a motion that we appropriate 120,000. 340 is that the? Is that correct? That's yeah, 120,000. 340. That's I don't know if it is, but that's close enough. For, Second. Uh, for for uh, the, uh, the two lights road repaving and a uh, paving shoulder. The shoulder, right? Okay, moved and seconded. Now discussion from Council. Councilor Fritz. Um, I was surprised to see that the, the part of the of Two Lights Road that was looked at for shoulders was the flat, straight strip along the strawberry field. As um, Steve Harding said in here, that didn't seem to be a problem. I've never thought it was a problem. The problem where the shoulders need to be added is in the dip and the curve and the hill, not the straightaway. I, I think it would be a mistake to widen in the straightaway because that just makes people go faster. Plus, you it, have. You yeah. probably stripe it, maybe. Stripe well, it. right, but. Good, they got to see. <laughs> uh, see? <laughs> All right. You'll have your chance. <laughs> Got scary out there at the 911 committee, huh? <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, Councilor Fritz. I, I would be opposed to widening the and putting a strip along the strawberry field area because that is flat and there is good sight distance. But I think we need to really consider putting a small shoulder where there's a hill and a dip and a curve. Okay. And I think that needs to be looked at, and we have to have a price before we put a price. And we also have to talk to the state, as indicated in here, and see what their requirements are going to be before we say how much we want to spend. Yeah, I want to address part of what Councillor Fritz said. The thought of going, the reason that there's no bikeway shoulder proposed for the balance of the road is is the same issue that was debated with the bikeway exactly. two and a half years. It's expensive. And that's that if you're going to do it for liability reasons, you need to meet the standards. If you try to put it in a, in a, even a smaller width, we just want the money to do it. Right. The, uh, particularly as you look at the dip, you have big bankings on either side. You have that. You, you know, I remember the debate. Henry Berry, then, Count, then Henry Berry, now Councilor Berry, came in specifically saying you're not really just talking the bikeway, then you're talking the shoulder drop off. It's just once you get into that area, you, you can't do it. The reason the strawberry field portion is chosen is because actually, you're right, people do drive along quickly there, and it just gives a measure of, of safety to, uh, to those on bikes. Uh, but I, I mean, I ride a bike, I walk in that area, and I ride a bike in that area, and there, the safety problem is the dip and the curve and the hill, and if we're going to do anything, it should be there. 
Between between Pheasant and, or between Hannaford Cove Road and the park. And I, I guess I don't understand why we even analyze the strawberry field area and not that area to even see what the cost would be. be, be this is, if I might, Madam Chairman, this goes back to I was out there with Councillor William H. Jordan right. and Henry Berry, and that's what they suggested, and that's why the scope of the project is before you, because I didn't feel comfortable just going ahead and doing it because a, a then councillor and, and about to be a councillor suggested it. I thought the council really ought to determine the scope. If you don't want to do the, the strawberry field, that's not a big deal. But we do need to move forward on uh, getting the, the rest of the road done because it's falling apart. Uh, uh, Madam Chair. Move or, out of chair at the moment. Or, well, <laughs> um, and that, two Lights Road is dangerous. I mean, it's, there are potholes. You know, I walk on that road, and it is a disaster. And you take your life in your hands, whether you have People drive faster on it anyway. If we have it by the strawberry fields, we expand the shoulder, you know, three feet. It's going to not going to change how fast those people drive, yes. but it's going to pr provide more safety for the people on that road. If I had my way, would do the shoulder all the way down Two Lights Road because that would be the safest thing to do. But you know, this council voted down bike paths, so I think we need to. Uh, improve the road. It's dangerous now, and we need to provide as much protection wherever we can along that road. That's my feeling. Madam Chair? Yes. Could I ask a question? Just as part of the regular repaving, if we're going to repave the whole thing, how much of a shoulder is there when it's repaved? It, it varies considerably, but it, it, for the most part, you get about four inches. So, I'm about sorry, what? Four what? About four to five inches. Four to five inches. Where's the center of the shoulder mm. with? Four to five inches. Outside the, the edge line, Bob? Yeah, it's minimal. Yeah. You're not agreeing just because I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Trance. From the 25 foot width of the road, if the road is 25 feet from the wherever, the whole width, you're saying that if we pave the shoulder when we redo the road, we're only going to get another four or five inches? No, I think the proposal is to pave three feet. Yeah. yeah. Along That's the strawberry field, but if we didn't do that, oh. no, I just but if mean. But didn't do that, you'd match the existing width say, right now. Right, it'd be the same width. You wouldn't get any wider. Question. Now I'm confused. I'm sorry. Um, if we j aside from the extra ten, the extra three foot shoulder three by the foot. strawberry field, aside from all that, if you if we're just going to have M dot or whoever repave the road. Mm -hmm. How much of a shoulder is there? That's what I was asking. There is no paved shoulder at that point. There is no paved no, shoulder. There's just a gravel okay. shoulder. I've never really looked at it closely, <laughs> not being around on the council when the bike. Whenever we overlay roads, we match the existing pavement width. And down there, I think it varies 23, 22 feet wide. So we would match that. OK, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Roberts, I took the opportunity of uh, driving down the, the road. I know there's about 12 houses that are really quite close to the road. So obviously, widening or putting on shoulders, whatever, is a problem. But I think it's more of a, the problem as I see it is that all of our connector roads are basically in the same situation. The council has no policy as to where we're going with this. So I would like to see us just actually repave the existing surface and have it instructed that they also bevel so that you don't have a lip or somebody on a bicycle. And you can use a good uh, backfill to accomplish that. I know on, on Fowler it hasn't been done and you can, I've seen bicycles go flying, I've seen people, to ro I've seen people rolling their ankles on it. Um, so it was a short term fix, that road needs to be fixed. I would say let's just repave it the way it is, use uh, some kind of a material just to bevel from the edge of the asphalt off on a, on a bevel, but as level as you can make it, but, but not uh, impeding or going further into people's yards. So you're saying with Councillor Fritz that you do not want to pave that shoulder when they redo the road? Not without a full discussion of where we're going with all the roads and repave it. But we don't have the money. This money is no, I know. to this I, road. No, I'm not suggesting we repave all of them now, but to have the council sit down in a workshop sometime and so we find out what we're going with all these side roads. It, should be, it seems to me it should be one policy for each of the connector roads rather than trying to bite off each road at, one at a time. But each road is different in each Well, location. they're all each pretty... Each house placement is different, and each but they're all, of the road is different. When you drive them and you look around, they all have the same issues, uh, narrow, curving, wide, wide in some spots, extremely narrow in others, with houses sitting right on the edge here and there, and 
It's the same problem everywhere. All right, we have uh, Councilor McGinty. Um, I agree with Jack on this. I think we should get it done and save ourselves $10,000 in the process, it sounds like. Also, um, this does include the drainage issue also, right? Okay. That, uh, that, Council Barry. That, that edge that we're talking about is, is gravel. People walking along, are having difficulty walking along, and as Councilor Watson has pointed out, I, I think there is a speed problem there where you come down over that hill by the time you hit the flat, you're going 50 miles an hour, especially with the, the rest of traffic in the summer, which is uh, just terrible. And uh, the uh, uh, area along uh, from, from the beginning of Two Lights Road down to the, I mean, I drive that two or three times a day. And along that strawberry field, if they had a uh, flat area, it wouldn't be any trouble at all, I don't think, to just put your blade along there and you could, you could uh, put a small two or three feet area for people to either ride bikes or walk for that section of the road. And I think that that's a safety issue that ought to be addressed. And for $10,000 in a $14 million budget, uh, I think while you're doing it, you ought to do it right. Councilor swift -Kayetta. Have there been, do we have a record of, have there been accidents along those 13 No, people feet walk or? by there all the time. People jog by there all the time, but I think it's a safety issue. I'm just trying to discern if there's been a problem already. There. Well, there's a motion on the floor for the full 120. Mm -hmm. so it was seconded. It what was, was seconded. That, that was the again, motion that is presently on the floor. Clarification, what does that do? On the table. So that includes the, the That includes the paved shoulder. Yep. feet of paved shoulder. Sure. And that's when they redo the road, mm -hmm. instead of putting gravel back in the shoulder, this includes the paving of the shoulder on that side, that one. By the strawberry field. By the strawberry field. Madam Chair, I, I uh, request Which, we move the, move the motion. The, the, the uh, owner of the property has agreed that that's a good idea. He spoke with him. The question has been moved. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? And then, oh, an indecision. South end of the Cape, I always get the show. So, all right, so now you need to look at that issue again. That motion failed for the full amount. You need to decide what you want to do. Councilor Fritz. I'm still wondering, according to our information, do, do we know what the state is going to require for standards? Well, we're not going for the standards of bike paths four feet on either side of the road. Oh, I don't mean bike paths. I'm being paving. just in paving the road. Oh. Yes, OST reviewed this with the state, has looked at the cost estimates. We've had discussions with them. Uh, we believe the 101340 will enable us to shim and pave the road and put in the drainage additions to the satisfaction of the state of Maine. What we don't know is whether or not they'll require full bone plans at 19000 340 or uh, the lesser plans of 7500 I, I have a question. But isn't that, that's part of the cost that we're talking about. That's, I put it in just in case. So that's included in the 101? In the 110. 110. The Councilor, cost. Go ahead, go ahead. You all done, Councilor Fitz? The higher cost of engineering is included. Right. Okay. Councilor Barry. There have been saw horses every February for the last 38 years on that one portion of Two Lights Road that is not drainable. Will this uh, proposal positively deal with that in a, in a way so that there will no longer be saw horses in the middle of the road? You're dealing with water, you know. You can fix all the leaks in the world. They may pop up someplace else, but the intent well, is I'm to fix about the draining. That one place. No, no, Councilor Berry. What it will do is we'll add additional capacity off the road for water. But if we still have a lot of excess water, uh, we will still have some water issues. There. I don't see that but as it, a solution. It, it provides additional capacity. Well, you just got to increase the capacity to take care of that water. If you had four inches before, maybe now you'll only have one. Well, they put a, a, a dry well in there next to that property. They didn't do it. it was, what they got to do is drain it down. Well, the one proposal was a few years ago was to drain it all the way down to the ocean, which is too expensive. It's prohibitively expensive. You can't do that. You probably can't do it environmentally either. The answer is. I don't know, but anyway. Madam All right, we need to have another motion on the floor here. Councilor Watson. Madam Chair, I have a question. Was um, the proposal that Michael put forward, the 120, um, 
Item two in the OST proposal, reclaiming the existing pavement and surface paved from 77 to Park Road intersection, 99,000 plus the additional, or was it number four? It's option four. It's option four. Um, how does four, if we do two, which is more expensive, if we were to do two, how does that differ? We don't get a shoulder, but we get, it says that's the best long, best long term solution. Yeah. So I'll let, Bob and I had quite a discussion and debate about that, so I'll let him address it. Uh, yeah, viewpoint one. Issue one. Um, obviously, that is the preferred alternative. Uh, the manager and I spoke about the availability of funds for uh, future road projects, and I expressed my concern with all the other needs that we have out there in the future. We have Broad Cove Road, we have Cottage Farms Road, we have a lot of projects uh, within the next couple of years that if we had extra monies, it would be wise to put it towards those projects, especially Broad Cove Road, which if you've been down there lately, you can tell it's a mess. And so the projects aren't going to go away. And obviously, you like to always do the best alternative and the best fix, but we can't always afford to do that. So I feel confident that a good shim and an overlay on Two Lights Road will, will gain us a lot of uh, uh, tenure down there. But if we have extra monies, we really should put it towards Broad Cove Road next year. So that's you know, item four. Yes. And so what we did is we took item four and added three foot, so, foot shoulders, right? That we just just was voted down. Yes. With so the change. next motion is to, I move that we go by the O suggestion, of the most cost-effective proposal of being item four: surface, surface, surface. Ugh, I can't talk. Surface paved from 77 to the end of the road, approximately 900 9,000 lineal feet, linear feet, 82,000, and then the additional cost of uh, petroleum increases, whatever that is. What's that? 110, you think? Yeah, 110. Uh, for 110,000. Second. All right. Is there any dis Councilor Fritz? So then, the, the when you're saying to the end of the road versus in three, one, uh, four includes the parking lot, the parking space at the end of the road. No, just to the end of the road, not the parking lot. Our right of way stops basically at the start of the driveway to the Coast Guard property. Okay. Our right of way does not extend in the parking area at all. Existing pavement. Existing okay. pavement. Then I guess I don't understand the difference between three and four. There's a compact line as you start down the hill just um, beyond the dirt section of Beacon Lane that is actually where the state maintenance section stops and our section begins. So that's what option three would be paving to that point. Okay. Option four paves right to the very end of the road. We believe there's no sense in leaving a small portion of it. Mm -hmm. So you want to, Madam Chair, is it item four? That question, you, question to Bob. Mm -hmm. Councilor Rabbit. Bob, what, um, when you surface pave, again, I'd like to get some clarification. Do you do anything at all to the shoulders? What we would do is uh, address the shoulders after the paving and match them into the existing, the new pavement grade, the new finished pavement grade. Great. So we would bring the shoulder material or add shoulder material to that point. To basically there was level a drop off. Level Some places there may not be a drop off. Thank but you. In places that there are, we would bring that in. That's what I wanted to hear. Yep. Thank you. Now we have a motion moved and seconded on the table. I'm going to call this question. All those in favor? Whoa, this is a nice change. <laughs> Opposed? Get what you can. Well, I don't know. It has, the motion carries. Now, Councilor Ma Swift Cata. Madam Chair. Councilor Swift Cata. I would like to move that we take an item out of order and revisit item number, was it 103? Because the property owners have come to some conclusion. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, move second. second. Move and second. All those in favor to take the item out of. Order to revisit item number 103. All those in favor, all those opposed? Fine, may we have a report from somebody on this committee? <laughs> Madam Chairman, members of the town council, the Dunham's and the Strouds have come to me. If you'll indulge us for just a moment. <laughs> One more time, we won't bother you next month, Bill. Uh, <coughs> Penny, your recommendation of uh, Becky's Cove Lane. Becky Jordan will be a happy lady. She will be. And if uh, that's okay with the council and the 911 committee, when they review it, 
Yeah. The, I, I checked the list of the town names that, that the 911 committee gave me. There's nothing on there remotely like that. So I don't see a problem. Becky's Cove Lane, is that what you right. said? Mm -hmm. I believe that we could probably accept that name and that we should, re, uh, we should just contingent, contingent on the on approval the of the 911 committee. committee. But the, the list of names that they gave me, um, that, you know, there's not, there's no nothing. N there's no was, similar town around no. town name like that. All right. So I'd like anyway, Becky oh, just okay. commercial street. I'd like to move that we uh, approve contingent upon uh, it passing the 911 committee's approval. Approval that we approve Becky's Cove Lane as the name of that. I'll second street. that. It's been moved and seconded that the name Becky's Cove Lane be applied to the road in question <laughs> <laughs> with the approval of the 911 committee, which will come very quickly, I'm sure. Uh, any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you for thank your you. cooperation. Thank you very much for helping us resolve this issue. <laughs> Couldn't welcome. have done it without you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, moving on to uh, item 106. Consideration of a request to authorize design and permitting of new dugouts at Holman and Capano Fields. And I'll ask Mike to uh, talk a bit about that. Yes, uh, these are the major uh, baseball, softball fields at the high school. And the uh, parents would really like to see some dugouts there for, to improve uh, protection from the weather as well as to make it have the look and feel of a baseball field, uh, both the fields. Uh, the actual construction uh, will be inexpensive. Uh, someone's already agreed to donate all the concrete blocks. Uh, they're looking for other donations. The school board has reviewed the project and indicated support. Uh, it does cost money because this requires planning board site plan approval to go out and have some plans done, to show it on the plans, and then to make sure that it's built according to the plans. And, uh, that adds up to 55, 60, and I would recommend that you authorize that expense with the funds to come from the funds remaining in the special studies fund and that you authorize us to apply for all necessary permits. So moved. Second. Any more discussion? Oh, thank you. Definitely. All those in favor? Getting dark. That's what happens when you have your items at the end of the agenda, boy. They just move right along. You're welcome. You're getting dark. You're I would have had dinner if I'd known for breakfast. <laughs> Consideration of a report from the town manager recommending implementation strategies for the strategic direction of rescue services for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Madam. I see the rescue people are here, and we'd love to give you an opportunity to speak, but it is getting late. I will say one thing about this item. It is to be, the report will be received and, re, and referred to workshop. So moved. I'll second that. Well, I mean, they don't have to say anything. No, they might want to. But you could say something if you want. Evelyn? Huh? We'll have the chief speak for us. <laughs> I think if it's one of the workshop paying, if you refer to the workshop, I'd be able to discuss it then. Thank you, Evelyn. Sergeant, Sergeant, do you the sergeant? Chief? Captain. You're the captain. captain. You're captain. the captain, right? I knew that, Evelyn. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Has it been moved and seconded? Yes. What? Yeah. I moved second. by McGinty, oh. right? Yeah. Councilor yes. McGinty. I seconded it. Moved it, and Councilor Barry seconded it. Is there any more discussion on this item? What is the motion, Councilor McGinty? To receive it and send it to a workshop at the earliest convenience. Yes. Thank you. All those in favor? Good job, John. Opposed? <laughs> Number 108, consideration of a receipt of the proposed municipal budget for fiscal 2001 and it's referral to the Finance Committee. That's a receive and refer to Finance Committee item. It's the appropriate motion. I'll move that. Second. <laughs> His turn. Right. Move that the uh, budget be, uh, proposed budget be received and referred to the Finance Committee. John seconds it. Thank you. Is there any more Council discussion on that? It. All those in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Thank you. Yeah. Item number 109. Consideration of receipt of the proposed budgets for the town's special funds for fiscal 2001 and their referral to the Finance Committee. It's been moved that they be, that, that happen, they be referred to the Finance Committee. I'm going to try and let someone else second, Henry, just for the fun. I think that's one of them. Somebody would second. second. Well, Councilor swift Kiera. I don't think she's seconded something since she's been on this council yet. I don't think she does. You have to move fast. Yeah, you have to be very fast at it. Is there any discussion on that? 
to try well, to hold on. Just, I, just very briefly, I have a meeting on, I think, next Monday morning with uh, uh, Councillor Watson in her capacity as chairman of the Finance Committee. And during that meeting, we're going to be trying to, to come up with an agenda for the, your specific review of the municipal budget. So if there's any suggestion that any council member has of items you want to focus on and make sure that we allot time for, if you could uh, particularly let Ruth know prior to Monday, that would be a lot of help uh, so that we, we make sure we set aside sufficient time to discuss the issues you want to talk about. I also urge all councillors during the budget process, when you have any questions, you want details, you want reports, you want lengthy answers, make a, uh, set a time with the manager and get that information so that you have all the explanations yeah. and all the data that you need to help you move towards decisions or at least move toward discussion even. Um, rather than have the discussion and then ask the manager at the meeting and two weeks later he has to come back with the information. Let's see if we can do that heads up. All right, there's an item to move this to the Finance Committee. All those in favor? <coughs> Thank you. I'm not going to ask for opposed. The motion carries unanimously. Item number 110, <clears throat> consideration of the proposed dog warrant for the year 2000. The town clerk, please. Um, I recommend that the council approve the annual dog warrant that um, directs the animal control officer to notify owners of unlicensed dogs within seven days um, to remit the license fee plus a $10 fee. Um, anyone who is um, on the list as of April 1st will be subject to this warrant procedure and anyone that does not comply with the um, ordinance will be entered into summons and complaint into court. He's been at my door knocking for licenses for my dog. So he's so. doing a great he's doing a great job. So again, anyone that has a dog, please, please by March thirty first. I I think I remember getting one of these after a dog had died and I didn't even, you know, go in to have the license renewed. So I would think that they wouldn't be hauled to court. They could come bring in Well the death we've certainly <laughs> notified we certainly notified <laughs> folks, Councillor, that if they no longer are in possession of a dog, to notify us so we can take them off the list. You better keep the death years. certificate for those dogs. <laughs> Don't want to be thought of as a scoff law. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so moved. So moved. Seconded. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? It is unanimous, Clerk. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Are there any items of discussion not on the agenda that the public would wish to bring up? We have these. Before the council goes home this evening, there is a little bit of confusion during one week of April as to what night one of the budget meetings is. So we need to discuss that after the meeting, and we'll make sure everyone's on the same page. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for motion for adjournment. Second. It's been moved and second. We adjourn. All those in favor? Need to sign it. You in favor, guys? <clears throat> I'd like to ask. I want to know who out there who who put this in front of me says think right. I heard it was Councillor Roberts. Was that true? I did it one time, but not this evening. Must have been left there. Ah, for all those people who sat in this chair in the last month. <laughs> really? Think right. It bothered me. Each item I said, my gosh, think right, think right. All right. What's Double the date? The 11th or 12th of April? We, we are adjourned. We voted. Is that, is that the